we're going to be counting down the top 100 magic items in 5th edition D&D. These are all going to be basic items because taking into account every item from 5th edition would be kind of crazy. I haven't used or ran a game involving every item in the game. However, recently I have finally given out every single basic D&D magic item and am ready to give my thoughts on them. We're taking into account an item's overall power alongside its rarity, how often you can use it in a game, and how fun it is to use. This is a list made up of my personal experiences, so if you think an item is too high or too low on the list, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, let's begin with item number 100. A lot of items just missed this list, but I think that it would be incomplete without the plus one weapon. This magic item is a foundational piece in Dungeons & Dragons. It's usually the first magic item that most parties get. The Dungeon Master's Guide recommends giving this type of item out about 5th level which also coincides with the greatest jump in power that a player usually gets. By a certain level, every single player character should be rocking with at least one plus one magic item, whether that be a ranger and a bow, a fighter and a greatsword, or even a wizard with a small plus one dagger, just in case for emergencies only. But seriously, it's hard to imagine a party of Dungeons & Dragons characters without this particular item. It is foundational, it is necessary, and therefore it is item number 100 on our list. But next up we have an often underutilized and overlooked item, the Wand of Enemy Detection. This rare attunable item is very simple in what it does. It tells you if there's an enemy nearby and what direction it is. Now it doesn't tell you the distance of a harmful enemy, but this particular item is useful inside of combat, outside of combat, in a dungeon, in an open field, no matter what, you're going to want to have this particular item. It detects visible or non-visible enemies for up to a minute, which is a long period of time. And actually this item is a great thing to break out for roleplay heavy parties, because breaking this out at like a masquerade ball or a big political banquet provides some great moments of tension and roleplay. Because whoever has this item will know that there is an enemy nearby, they'll know the general direction, but not exactly what the enemy is. And of course, when you're combing through a dungeon, this particular item helps you find where the bad guys are. But also, if your party is a bit lost, and they've cleared out all the other enemies in the dungeon, except for the boss monster, then this item will point them in the direction where they generally need to go. Trust me, it happens far more often than you'd think. Is this a game-breaking magic item? No, not by any means. Is it always useful to have in a party? Absolutely. As I've DM'd more and more games for new players, this is one of the first items I like to give them. But moving on from this one, now we're going to item number 98, the Headband of Intellect. This is a simple magic item overall, it just sets your intelligence score to 19 once you attune to it. Now intelligence is an often dumped stat in D&D 5th edition, mainly because it doesn't do a whole lot for you except for ability checks. Mainly you just have a character like a wizard who's pumping intelligence. However, that's not to say that intelligence checks are meaningless by any means. I know in my campaigns things like arcana checks, history checks, nature checks, investigation checks come up all the time. And there is inherent power at just simply setting an ability score to 19. It also is a huge benefit to subclasses like an Eldritch Knight. And honestly, if you are a DM that gives intelligence extra boosts, like you know an extra language or have an extra proficiency depending on your intelligence modifier, I think that the Headband of Intellect would probably jump about 50 or 60 spots instantly if you were in a game like that. We should not underestimate getting a 19 in any ability score. It's very, very powerful. Just the one problem is that we really need more things we can do with our intelligence score on a game to game basis. And because of that, the headband of intellect comes in at spot 98 on this list. Now the next item is so simple that even someone with one intelligence could use it. At 97 is the ever smoking bottle, an uncommon item that is basically a smoke bomb but of course reusable. So as an action, you open up this bottle within a 60 foot radius, this heavily obscuring smoke appears. Then for each minute, the bottle remains open. The radius increases by another 10 feet up to a maximum of 120 feet. However, a 60 foot radius of 
instantly obscured area is extremely powerful. It's great for a party trying to make an escape, great if you're taking fire from enemies and want them to have disadvantage when firing at you. Against enemy mages this is great, because spells like Magic Missile, which normally can't miss, only happen if you can see your target. The Ever Smoking Bottle is a great piece of utility that any rogue, ranger, monk, fighter, etc. should keep inside their bag. This is one of those items that is so simple and limited only by your own creativity. But now we're going to be moving into a more situational item. Well that is depending on your playstyle, because now coming in at spot 96 is the Ring of Feather Falling. This rare magic item allows you to gently descend 60 feet per round and not take any fall damage. Now it's kind of up to you how often you're going to be using this Ring of Feather Falling, and also kind of up to your DM. If you're constantly fighting in these flat planes, then you're not going to get much use out of it. If every village you walk into has a maximum height of two stories, probably not going to get the most use out of that. However, if you're constantly trekking through mountains or in this urban style fantasy campaign with skyscrapers arcing up towards the night sky, then the Ring of Feather Falling is going to be your best friend. The number of daring, unique, creative maneuvers you can pull off without fearing fall damage is immense. Players with this ring love jumping out of windows, falling off of cliffs, and generally doing death-defying stunts without basically any consequences. The more chaotic and daring a player, the more the Ring of Feather Falling is going to make you happy. And with such a narrow scope, it's never going to break your game. And honestly, no matter who you are, when you need the Ring of Feather Falling as you're falling off a cliff, you're going to be glad that you had this item. So because of all that, the Ring of Feather Falling is sitting comfortably at spot 96. And coming up next at spot 95 is a pair of boots that any stealthy character would love to have. These, of course, are the uncommon Boots of Elven Kind. These stylish boots give any character advantage on stealth checks that require silent movement. And straight up, I think every D&D character can remember a situation when they had to silently sneak past a group of guards. The Boots of Elvenkind allow any character to do this because they do not require attunement, so that means you can put this on your plate armor carrying fighter and take away that disadvantage that they usually have, or give it to your normal rogue and have their stealth go higher and higher and higher. I'm really putting a lot of value here on the versatility and the amount of characters that the Boots of Elvenkind can work for. Because again, quite literally every single character would want the Boots of Elvenkind. No character is hurt by having the Boots, and you're not losing out on an attunement slot. So if you're ever in a situation and you have the chance to buy the Boots of Elvenkind, or you are a DM and are just trying to figure out that small but powerful magic item to give to your players, the Boots of Elvenkind is a great choice. And now moving on to spot 94, we have the Eyes of the Eagle. This uncommon magic item boosts one of the most often used skills in all of Dungeons & Dragons, the Perception skill. How often every session are you making perception checks? For most D&D players, it's pretty much every single session. And even if you aren't the quote unquote wisdom character of the party with a super high perception, you are still going to be in situations where you're going to have to make a perception check, say if you're on watch, or you're trying to spot an enemy that's sneaking up on you. For a low level character, the eyes of the eagle are extremely powerful. The only thing that's really holding it back is that it consumes an entire attunement slot. However, there are still many high level characters that would burn that attunement slot so that they could have advantage on all their perception checks. At least the perception checks that involve sight, but who are we kidding? That's most of them. And now moving on to slot 93, we have the plus three ammunition. And spoiler alert, this is the only ammunition on the list. And this is why I don't think of ammunition that highly. It's because this magical ammunition, at least in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, is one use only. I suppose it would be a little bit different if you could reuse those plus three arrows. Heck, it would be different if you could reuse those plus one arrows. I would actually enjoy that a lot as a DM, but the ammunition is one use only. And so that leads to an interesting scenario where you kind of have to force the players to keep track of their ammunition. 
Now, some players are really, really good about this, while others slack off. And then when they should have had only three shots at plus three, now they've taken 10 at plus three, and the entire battle is kind of screwed up a little bit. And again, that's not to mention that they are only one use and a very rare item. Gold is a precious and valuable resource. Are you really going to be spending it all on ammunition? For all the magic items ahead, my thought process is, would I rather have 10 plus three arrows or this magic item? And again, 10 plus 3 arrows can be a huge swing throughout large portions of the campaign. And definitely, if you can get magical ammunition, why not use it in your games? A plus 3 to hit and to damage is incredibly powerful, but it's its single use that limits ammunition to at most spot 93 on this list. And coming up just ahead of ammunition at spot 92 is the Potion of Vitality. And after I just got finished talking about ammunition and how I don't like its limited use, why am I putting a potion above it? Well, it's because the potion of vitality is so darn good. Firstly, the ability to remove any exhaustion you are suffering from is such a huge benefit. Exhaustion is debilitating in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. And this is the only potion that you can buy that removes it. Not only does it remove it, it removes all that exhaustion. It also cures any disease or poison affecting you. Now, admittedly, this can usually be cured if there's a paladin in the party, but if you don't have a party with a paladin, this potion is extremely valuable. In addition, for 24 hours afterward, you regain the maximum number of hit points when you spend a hit die. For tough dungeons, a potion of vitality is indispensable. If you have a long, grueling march where your party builds up two, three, four levels of exhaustion, a potion of vitality can be a lifesaver. I considered very, very, very few potions to actually be on this list, but I knew without a doubt the potion of vitality needed to be here. And that's why it sits at spot 92 on this list. And finally, we have at spot 91, the Amulet of the Plains. This particular item, with a successful intelligence check, will allow you to cast Plane Shift. And even on a failed save, you still have a 60% chance of traveling to the plane you wanted to go to, just a little bit off target. If you ever need to hop between planes, this amulet is one of the best options. Sure, if you don't have a high intelligence, it can be a bit risky. However, there is actually no limit to the amount of times you can use this amulet in a row, so if you fail the intelligence check, and even if you're shunted to a completely different plane of existence, you can keep on remaking that intelligence check until you succeed and you get to the actual plane you want to go to. Or if you go to a random spot on the plane, you just trek to where you originally wanted to end up. Whatever you roll, the Amulet of Planes actually doesn't have that bad of a downside. Maybe you spend a minute hopping back and forth between planes before you get to that exact right place you want to go to, but otherwise it's just a very, very fun magic item. Now, it can be a little bit of a nightmare for a DM that doesn't have a ton of other planes ready, so if you give this item out as a DM, you need to write down a few random locations that a party can go to. Just have four other planes in the tank and two or three locations each that the party can pop up into. It can be a fun little side quest. Perhaps the party jumps into the equivalent of the Salem Witch Trials in Gehenna. Maybe there's a feast going on in Arborea. Or maybe they've ended up in a very, very weird layer of the Abyss. All of these things are possible with the Amulet of the Plains, and it allows for the story to move forward. It's an item that's both super useful and zany. It brings out all the best qualities of Dungeons & Dragons. And at the price of just an attunement slot, I could not think of putting any other item here except for the Amulet of the Plains. Now to magical item number 90, Restorative Ointment. This uncommon magic item is ridiculously good at low levels, especially if you have very limited healing inside of a party. With up to five doses, the Restorative Ointment heals 2d8 plus two hit points, cures any poison, and cures any disease. Its two downsides is that it's an action to use, and it can be very limited. However, being an uncommon item, you're going to be seeing this restorative ointment often. Characters between 1st and 3rd level benefit from this item heavily. That's because its 2d8 plus 2 healing is enough to keep you in a fight at those low levels. Usually healing suffers from a big problem in D&D, where you heal, but it's just not enough. The healing is outdone very quickly. And then you have to ask yourself, well, why did I heal? Is there something better I could have done with my turn? 
With the ability to heal a whopping 18 hit points, the restorative ointment has explosive potential. While it is limited in the number of times it can heal, the restorative ointment is so good for low level parties that I have to give it the 90th spot. Now we have another favorite of low level parties coming up at spot 89, the Broom of Flying. And what can I say about this item that hasn't already been said? It's a flying broom. You get to roleplay as a witch. The aesthetic is there. The ability to fly at 50 feet a turn is there. Or 30 feet a turn if you're fat. And the sneakily good ability to send the broom within one mile of you to a destination on its own. Your broom can act as its own little messenger pigeon. You just tie a note to the broom and you send it to your destination. And then it returns to you once it's done. The Broom of Flying is an absolutely fantastic magic item. However, it's a bit bulky and there are better flying magic items out there. We might even see one or two coming up. But whatever the case, the ability to fly opens up so many creative avenues in D&D 5th edition that I would be remiss not to have the Broom of Flying here at spot 89. And next up we have the Mace of Smiting. And this is probably one of the better Bane weapons in the game. And what do I mean by a Bane weapon? Well, it's a weapon that works particularly well against a certain type of creature, like undead, fiends, or in this case, constructs. This weapon becomes a plus three when you're attacking a construct, or a plus one weapon any other time. When you roll a 20 while attacking with this weapon, it does an additional seven damage, or 14 when you're attacking a construct, and it destroys constructs if it has 25 hit points or fewer and it has the ability to one-shot a construct on a natural 20, if it has 25 hit points or fewer. And that is actually most constructs. Many different classes can make use of the Mace of Spiting. Fighters, barbarians, clerics, you name it. And constructs are actually one of the most common creatures we see in written adventures. Animated armors, flying swords, rugs of smothering. All of these things are considered constructs, and it's more than likely if you get a critical hit with this weapon, you instantly destroy them. This weapon is so good because you are vastly more likely to fight a construct more than once in a campaign than not. And since this weapon provides worthwhile benefits, even when you're not fighting a construct, it comes in here strongly at spot 88. And coming up next at spot 87 is probably one of the most underrated items in all of D&D 5th edition. I actually really struggled figuring out where to put this item, because in some campaigns, it's probably a top 30 item. In other campaigns and with other groups, you're gonna struggle a bit. It might not have the impact that you want. So I decided to put this item at its floor. I don't think that in any campaign group, no matter how you're using it, that you could put this item below the 87th place. I want this item above a headband of intellect. I want it above the boots of elven kind. I want it above 10 healing potions. What I want, dear viewer, is the ring of mind shielding. This item has three effects that are very good. Firstly, you can hide it and you can make it invisible so no one even knows that you have it on. Secondly, you can prevent things from reading your mind. But not only that, magic can't know if you're lying, it can't know your alignment, it can't know anything about you. You stop all telepathic communication unless you allow it. In political intrigue campaigns or campaigns where you are fighting things with psychic abilities, the Ring of Mind Shielding is a game changer. And it also allows you to get around the annoying little spell, Zone of Truth. With the Ring of Mind Shielding, you can lie under a Zone of Truth. And I have to say, one of my favorite combinations is having a character cast Zone of Truth, allowing the effects to wash over my character, and then just lying my ass off. Characters think because it's a Zone of Truth that you couldn't possibly be lying. But I've checked, and yes, the Ring of Mind Shielding allows you to do this. But also... Also, if all that wasn't good enough, the Ring of Mind Shielding keeps your soul when you die. Meaning that if you die, you don't need to directly go to the afterlife. You can be stuck inside that ring. And that allows you a lot of options in case, let's say, your character needs to be revived. While your body might be rotten and gone, the Ring of Mind Shielding protects your mind and allows it to stay there until you are perhaps able to find another host body or maybe a construct is built for you. There are many options, but the Ring of Mind Shielding provides all of them. And I am not kidding when I seriously wrestled with putting this item far, far higher. But, again, not all campaigns are the same, so this is the item's absolute floor at spot 87. 
And coming up next is a simple item at spot 86, the Goggles of Night. It feels like almost every class in D&D 5th Edition has dark vision, so if you are in a class without dark vision, things get difficult. By having the Goggles of Night, you just have dark vision, and it makes things so much easier for the player, the DM, just everybody. And because the Goggles of Night do not take up an attunement slot, you can just slip them over your head, no downsides. If you have a character without dark vision, there's no reason not to pick up the Goggles of Night. And for that reason, they come in comfortably at spot 86. And coming up next at spot 85 is an item that is limited, again, only by your creativity. It's the Decanter of Endless Water. Now, obviously, having Endless Water is really good in a lot of situations. If you're on a desert and have no access to water, the Decanter of Endless Water is literally a lifesaver. Its ability to act as a geyser also gives it some offensive capacity. It has the capacity to push a creature up to 15 feet away from you. That means smaller creatures next to a cliff or a window are in big trouble. I love watching a player activate the geyser function on this item and just pushing things all over the map. But also, the ability to create 30 gallons of water within 6 seconds is a lot of water. Especially when it is an infinite amount of water. Players can solve so many puzzles or fuck up so many villains' days just with a lot of water. I once had a group of players take their decanter of endless water to the top floor of a villain's castle and then just start pumping water into the castle. Because when you can make 300 gallons of water a minute, you can flood a lot of things very quickly. And again, just having this versatility in a party is fantastic. Which is why the Decanter of Endless Water comes in at spot 85. Hey everyone, before continuing with the video, I just want to give a shout out to the channel's affiliate and sponsor, Only Crits. Only Crits is an online store that specializes in dice sales and 5e adventure modules. They also carry in stock dice trays and other assorted D&D accessories. I personally love their Spell Scroll dice trays and their duck dice. I mean, look guys, they're ducks in dice. If that's not gonna sell you, I don't know what is. They also have other little small friends, like chickens or pandas. If you're looking for a fun one-shot, I'd recommend The Emperor's End, or if you're looking for a full adventure, I'd recommend The Mountain. Mountain Killer. It's a short adventure only running from levels 4 to 6, but it packs a lot of epic adventure and mystery in those short three levels. And it's set up so that you can drag and drop this plot into your homebrew adventures really easily. I've got an affiliate link in the description below, and if you enter the code DUNGEON, you will get a discount on your order. If you want awesome dice, accessories, or adventure modules, check out my friends at Only Crits. And now, back to the video. But coming up next at spot 84 is the Helm of Brilliance. The Helm of Brilliance has so many great effects. It gives you access to many great spells, the ability to detect undead, fire damage. Heck, you can even make your weapon a mini flame tongue weapon. The reason why the Helm of Brilliance is this low on the list is because of two reasons. Firstly, it is reliant on the gems on the helmet to activate. You might get a Helm of Brilliance with very few gems on it. And then, well, you're fresh out of luck. Now, you might get a Helm of Brilliance with a lot of gems on it, but eventually over the course of a campaign, that item is going to start to run out. However, its second Achilles heel is that when you take fire damage as a result of failing a spell roll, you roll a d20, and on a 1, this item explodes. Not only does it explode, but it does damage to everyone else around you. The ability for an item to just poof, go up in flames, that's a huge detriment. Especially because fire damage is one of the most common damage types in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Depending on the campaign, you might be taking a lot of fire damage, and then, oh boy you might be in for some trouble. Having this very rare, very powerful item just be destroyed kind of sucks. But the Helm of Brilliance is so good that it still makes spot 84 on the list. I take the Helm of Brilliance over a lot of other items, but I would not take the Helm of Brilliance over item number 83. And that item is the Winged Boots. The Winged Boots are again another favorite of a lot of D&D players. And I place the Winged Boots over the Broom of Flying for two reasons. Firstly, it's because the Winged Boots are a lot easier to conceal and use. And secondly, it's because the Winged Boots have a flying speed equal to your walking speed. Monks, Barbarians, characters with the mobile feet, all of these characters benefit from their increased walking speed. And with this bit of text, you can accelerate your flying speed to absolutely astronomical levels. 
And trust me, if you have a monk with the mobile feed with the winged boots that has a flying speed of 80 feet a turn, yeah, you'll see why it's such a powerful item. It's a fun item, don't get me wrong, but it's a powerful one. Do I think the winged boots are game breaking? No, I don't think so. I think that if you just plan around a character with winged boots, like having characters with bows, crossbows, ranged options in general, you're going to be fine. But these boots are definitely powerful. They're better than the Broom of Flying, and they deserve spot 83 on the list. And next up on this list is the Humble Staff of Healing. This staff might not look like a lot, but trust me, it's incredibly powerful. Able to be attuned to by a bard, cleric, or druid, the simple beauty of the Staff of Healing is that it provides healing spells without having to use one of the prepared spells or have something on your known spells list. Cure Wounds, Lesser Restoration, and more importantly, Mass Cure Wounds are all you're ever gonna need. Yes, Healing Word is better than Cure Wounds, but being able to heal up fully after a combat without needing to burn your very valuable spell slots is, well, valuable. And Mass Cure Wounds is a freaking amazing spell, but it's a 5th level spell, and there are many, many, many great 5th level spells that you'll probably want to use that spell slot on. So having that as part of the Staff of Healing, having a free party revive, essentially, if the rest of the party is unconscious, is incredibly good. The Staff of Healing makes even the most ardent battle cleric or the most crazed moon druid the party's healer. And it does it without the player having to sacrifice anything about their overall character sheet. You just hand them this item and watch them go. And it's for this versatility and flexibility that I'm giving the Staff of Healing the 82nd spot on this list. And finally, at spot 81, we have the Helm of Telepathy. I'll just say it, being able to spam Detect Thoughts is fantastic. Because something that a lot of players don't understand is that the surface base level thoughts are accessible via the detect thoughts without any role. You can just get the general emotions or intentions of creatures. It's an extremely powerful spell, and being able to cast it at will, that's crazy. And additionally, this helm allows you to use a bonus action to contact a creature and send a message to them. During intense negotiations, you are able to look at one of your party members and bonus action message them without talking out loud. That's an incredible tool in your tool belt. And it's not one that should be underrated in any way. There's also a low level suggestion ability there, but the DC is only 13 so you're not going to be able to get it off very often. However, the infinite detect thoughts makes up for it. If you give this item to the right player with the right mindset, they are going to be able to go absolutely nuts in your campaign. And here's the thing, as a DM, you'll also be able to provide them with a lot of information. Because when you know that Detect Thoughts is basically going to be applied constantly, you're able to dispense a lot of free information. You're able to tell how an NPC's thinking, general baseline thoughts. Item number 80. If you like tricking the enemies and throwing a little bit of randomness into your magic items, then the Deck of Illusions is the item for you. Coming in at spot number 80, the Deck of Illusions allows you to throw down a random card from a deck and it creates an illusory creature. These creatures range from a simple goblin to a red dragon. You can control this illusion within 120 feet of yourself. Now for stealth missions or times when the party just wants to cause chaos, this is a fantastic magic item. There are way more hits in the deck of illusions than duds. You have a high likelihood to get more of the really impactful illusions like giants or beholders rather than some of the less useful ones like goblins. And if you use the Deck of Illusions in combat, it requires an action, a DC 15 investigation check, in order to understand that this is an illusion. Or if something physical passes through the illusion, then it is revealed. But that's still a huge time waster in combat. Since the Deck of Illusions can be used by anyone and is versatile in and out of combat, I feel confident in putting it at spot number 80 on this list. Plus, it's an uncommon item that doesn't even require attunement. And that's actually the same for the next item on the list, one of the cornerstones of all D&D items at number 79, the simple, the wonderful Bag of Holding. With this bag, you have a pocket dimension that can hold up to 500 pounds and 64 cubic feet of items. What can I say about the Bag of Holding that hasn't already been set? 
carrying objects in Dungeons and Dragons, transporting them across vast distances is a problem that every party faces. With the Bag of Holding, you're able to transport heavy or extremely valuable items very easily. It is a simple tool that saves you and your party so many headaches. As a dungeon master for many, many parties, I'm just tempted to give it out immediately because it is that helpful for everyone involved. And not only that, but the Bag of Holding has a secondary benefit because when you place the Bag of Holding inside another extra dimensional space, it creates what is essentially a black hole. This hole opens a gateway to the astral plane and sucks any creature within 10 feet of it into the gate, and the creature cannot come back through. It is essentially a delete button for any creature close by. It's a wonderful emergency button to have in any party's back pocket. And so because of that added benefit, the fact that it's only an uncommon item, so you can get it very, very quickly, and it saves the party so much time and energy, the Bag of Holding has to come in at spot 79. And coming up next, perhaps a bit controversially, at spot 78 are the Wings of Flying. Now why are the Wings of Flying ahead of the Winged Boots? Well, the simple reason is this. While the Wings of Flying has a lower overall potential, it gives a base flying speed of 60 feet, while the Winged Boots only give a base flying speed equal to your walking speed. Additionally, the way that the Wings of Flying recharges its flying capacity is superior to the Winged Boots. Additionally, the Wings of Flying's recharge time, while theoretically a bit slower than the Winged Boots, is not enough to downgrade them in any way. Theoretically, if you roll 1s on all your 1d12 rolls to recharge your Wings of Flying, you can fly 3 hours in a 6 hour time period. And there are many scenarios where the Wings of Flying are actually recharging much, much faster than the Winged Boots. Because of this, if you're using both items to their full capacity, you're actually able to get more flying out of the Wings of Flying than the Winged Boots. And also, let's just come at this from the aesthetic perspective. Which is cooler for your character? To have boots that lift you up or to have literal bat wings or bird wings extend out of your back for an hour, making you look like an avenging angel? For me, the wings are just cooler. They inspire me more when I'm playing my character, and I think that we have to take that into account with these items. Not only do we want items that are mechanically brilliant, but also aesthetically brilliant as well. And for this reason, we have the Wings of Flying coming in at spot 78. But coming up next is one of the few cursed items that I considered for this list. At spot 77 is the Berserker Axe. This simple weapon has a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls and gives you a hit point maximum increase by one for each level you've obtained. So if you're at 10th level, you gain 10 extra hit points. If you're in a party with limited healing or you're the only frontline fighter, this increase in your hit point maximum is huge. Now what's the curse? Well, the curse is twofold. For one, you can pretty much only use this weapon. And secondly, if you are hit by a hostile creature in combat, and if you fail a wisdom saving throw, you go berserk, and essentially start attacking the closest creature to you. It's difficult to gauge how damaging this particular item is, because in some parties, you going berserk with this particular item is not really a big deal. Because you end the berserk when you start your turn, and there are no creatures within 60 feet of you. If you're in a party full of backline spellcasters or archers, this is not a difficult requirement to hit. You can go out of your berserking rage in combat and then you're just fine. However, in certain situations, you might then go and try and attack your friends. However, with proper party planning or a cleric with remove curse, this item's negative curse and effect become a lot less damaging. In fact, if you have a way to remove curse, my suggestion is if you're going into a boss fight, then you equip this item. If there's only one big enemy, like say, I don't know, an ancient red dragon, and you run up to this creature and start hitting it, then you have very little chance of other party members getting in the way, and for you accidentally doing damage to your own team. The Berserker Axe is very party dependent, but those extra hit points can get you out of so many tough jams. And it is a plus one weapon, so since there are ways to get around the curse with just a bit of extra party planning, 
I'm comfortable with putting the Berserker Axe at spot 77 on this list. And at spot 76 is another item useful for every single class, the Ring of Spell Storing. The name says exactly what it does. You can store a spell up to 5th level inside the ring, and by touching the ring you can cast the spell. Now if you're a spellcaster, this essentially gives you an extra spell, which is always great. But if you're a martial character or a character without the ability to cast spells, now you're opening up your entire playbook. Because you can have your wizard or sorcerer friend cast a spell into the ring, and then you can go about and use it on your own. A pocket sending spell, fireball, or pass without trace are all powerful options. If a group only needs one spell to be cast and otherwise doesn't need a spellcaster, the Ring of Spell Storing comes in clutch. And the great thing about this ring is it also allows you to use powerful NPCs to your advantage because this item allows you to use the spell DC of the caster who put the spell inside the ring. Maybe you can't bring a powerful archmage with you on a mission, however, you can store their whole person with a save DC of 20 in your Ring of Spell Storing. The only thing holding this item back truly is that it can only hold one spell. This gives it limited usefulness in certain situations because you might think that you need a fireball when you actually need a cone of cold. You think you want invisibility, but what you really needed is Featherfall. And because those situations pop up all the time with this particular item, I think it's only fair that it comes in at spot 76. It's no pushover, its ability is incredibly powerful, but it does have its limitations. And coming in next at spot 75 is another ring with an extremely powerful ability that again, has limitations. This is the rare item known as the Ring of X-Ray Vision. Oh, the Ring of X-Ray Vision. This is one of the best items you can possibly take into a dungeon. How many times have you begun to walk through a dungeon door and thought, wait a minute, what if there are enemies on the other side? Let's listen for enemies. Let's see what's happening in there. The Ring of X-Ray Vision allows you to bypass all of this. Trying to look through a door? No problem. Checking to see if a treasure chest is a mimic in disguise? Easy. Want to try to glance through the floor after prying up some stone tiles to see if you can just burrow down to the next level of the dungeon? Go ahead. Once again, you'll be shocked at just how many situations you can use the Ring of X-Ray Vision in. Now, its drawback is that you can only use it once per long rest unless you succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw. If you succeed, you're fine. You can use the ring again without incident. If you fail, you gain one level of exhaustion. Now, once again, you can offset this downside pretty easily. You can give the Ring of X-Ray Vision to a high constitution character, like a fighter or a barbarian. The ranger, with their tireless ability that helps them remove a level of exhaustion, and is also now a prime candidate for the Ring of X-Ray Vision after Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has been released. Or you can just simply bite the bullet and take the level of exhaustion. Sometimes if you know that you're not going to be needing to make lots of ability checks, it's perfectly okay to take one level of exhaustion. Two levels is a pretty steep price, and three levels of exhaustion is when you are being absolutely crippled in 5th edition. But all that is up to you as the player, and the Ring of X-Ray Vision gives you ways to mitigate these deficiencies within its item description. And again, I don't want to understate just how valuable it is to be able to look through these solid surfaces for up to a minute. So don't get it twisted, the Ring of X-Ray Vision absolutely deserves its spot on this list. And coming up next is another D&D staple item, the Portable Hole. The Portable Hole is exactly what it sounds like. It makes a portable hole. You stick this black fabric on any flat surface, and a hole opens up. The hole is cylindrical and 10 feet deep, allowing you to store a lot within it, even your party mates. See, here's the thing a lot of people miss. A creature can survive for up to 10 minutes within the portable hole, just breathing the air that's inside of it. Meaning, if you have a dungeon master that does group stealth checks, and if anyone fails the stealth check the entire group fails, the portable hole allows you to get around that little fact. Because the rogue in the party can lay out the portable hole, have the party jump inside, roll up the portable hole, and then go about their stealthing business for the next 10 minutes. Now you're making only one stealth check at plus 8. I forget the actual math, but I read somewhere that in a party with a rogue, cleric, fighter, and wizard, this increases your chances of a successful stealth check by something like 80%, which is fantastic. The portable hole gives you so much bang for your buck. 
The ability to hide things, including other creatures within an extra-dimensional space and transport them, is a powerful problem-solving tool. I'm going to be running a political intrigue campaign very, very soon, and you have to bet that I'm going to be putting the portable hole up for sale in my campaign store immediately. Because really, what D&D player doesn't want the opportunity to lay out a 10-foot deep hole anywhere they want? So I would have to be crazy not to put the portable hole here at spot 74 on the list. Now, coming up at number 73 is a potion, another consumable item which we know that I don't think very highly of. But this particular potion is so good, I have seen it single-handedly win boss fights. And once again, my thought process is, if I take this item for one boss fight, do I want it or all the other items before it on the list? If it's a boss fight I really need to win, or a fight where it seems absolutely impossible that I could win it, then yeah, I'm going to want to take this potion. Give this potion to a fighter, to a barbarian, to a paladin, to a rogue, to a monk, to a wizard, to a warlock, to anybody, and you have yourself a powerhouse. I can only be talking about, of course, the potion of speed. This very rare potion provides a simple benefit. For one minute, you are under the effects of the haste spell without concentration. What's the main downside of the haste spell? Well, when you lose concentration where the spell ends, you essentially lose your next turn. But you are in no danger of losing your turn when you drank this potion. Your speed is now doubled. Your AC, that's increased by two. You have advantage on all dexterity saving throws and you gain an additional action. I mean, wow, the haste spell is a fantastic buff spell. Used in the right situations, it can absolutely swing the tides of a D&D combat. I cannot overstate how incredible this advantage is. There is a reason why the potion of speed is a very rare item. I'd actually say that after drinking this potion, a character punches up about two levels from where they were. Give an entire party potions of speed and walk them into a battle, and they can probably punch up about four or five CR levels higher. Now, I understand that some people out there might be thinking, this potion isn't that good. And my response to that is just use it in your own D&D games. And if you have a DM who uses the common house rule that you can quaff a potion as a bonus action, oh my god, I take this potion before practically any others. I take this over a supreme healing potion, I take this over a potion of giant strength, I take it over so many other different items. This potion is a literal cheat code if you're fighting something like a dragon or some other large creature that relies on dexterity saving throws and lots of damage. Doubling your speed plus a free disengage or dodge action, that's just so powerful versus the right creatures. I've probably spent too much time already going over this item, but I have to give it lots of love. So I stand by my placement of the Potion of Speed here at spot 73 on the list. And next, at spot 72, beating out the Potion of Speed and everything before it, a plus one set of armor. New DMs might be scratching their heads at this one. A plus one set of armor. How good is that really? Well, to explain this, we need to get into a concept in 5th edition called bounded accuracy. Bounded accuracy is a design principle which limits the numeric bonuses to d20 based rolls. In simplified terms, what does this mean? The bonuses you gain in 5th edition D&D are smaller than in previous editions, meaning that a dungeon master can use low-level creatures against a higher-level party. They will still be able to hit high-level characters. In previous editions, you would literally just outscale the lower-level monsters. A goblin would not be able to hit an AC 34 character, because we had those at one point. We can get there in 5th edition, but it's very, very, very difficult and it requires just the right magic items in just the right way. However, this also means that any numeric increase to something like an attack roll modifier or to your AC has powerful effects, because since you're operating on that same scale, you only have a limited number of steps up. That's why the weapons only go up to a plus 3. A plus 3 is the equivalent of a plus 15% to hit if we're looking at a d20 roll. When we pair that with a proficiency bonus, a character at 20th level with a plus 3 longsword and a proficiency bonus of plus 6 
in rough design terms has a plus 45% chance to hit than they would have at first level with just a regular standard weapon. I'm simplifying a lot here, so don't pick up your pitchforks and torches and come at me in the comments. I'm trying to put this in general terms. But on the flip side, when we get a plus one to our AC, let's imagine it as a minus 5% chance to hit. Now, while you can scale a character, you can't really scale the lower level monsters. That goblin doesn't have a proficiency bonus that levels with the characters. So every bonus that you're giving to AC not only lowers the effectiveness of lower level creatures, but also higher level creatures. Some higher level creatures, like adult dragons, expect a higher or boosted AC, depending on the level. If you look at the Dungeon Master's Guide, they're expecting a plus one piece of armor at around 5th to 10th level to be given out. That brings it in line with the design principles of those CR 7 to 10 boss creatures. So naturally, that plus one piece of armor is going to maintain its power throughout the entire game. It's going to give that negative 5% bonus to all creatures. But at some level, especially if you have a scaling set of armor like leather armor, you are going to begin to leave those lower level enemies in the dust. And if you give out even a plus one set of armor too early, you begin to throw off 5th edition's bounded accuracy. And that's the trade-off. While as Dungeon Masters, we can still use every monster in the monster manual, just adjusting the ratios that we send them at their players from levels 1 to 20. I mean, theoretically, you'd have to send like 100 goblins at a level 20 character for them to even be a threat. But theoretically possible, and you can still use those lower level enemies for much longer. They're never going to have a situation where they cannot hit the players. But in that same vein, we have a much lower margin of error. Messing with the numbers, even with a plus one, has a huge effect. And I really wish Wizards of the Coast brought this up a lot more. Because they basically do not explain this concept in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And this leads to new Dungeon Masters unknowingly walking into an absolute shitstorm. So with all of this being said, I mean yeah, plus one armor, it's really damn good. You should really consider picking up plus one armor as soon as you can. Any plus to AC is really good. And so for that, spot 72 on the list. And at spot 71, we have the Cloak of Elvenkind. This little uncommon item gives anyone trying to see you, make a perception check against you, disadvantage, and gives you advantage on all stealth checks made to hide and uses sight, really. Most DMs that I've played with use stealth checks in terms of sight. Does the guard see you? Yes or no? In that case, you're going to have advantage on that stealth check because the Cloak of Elvenkind is going to help you blend in. Or if it's contested, you making a stealth check, them making a perception check, then this item is double dipping. You're getting advantage and they're getting disadvantage. That is powerful stuff. Going off advanced statistics, having this item while double dipping is the equivalent of having a plus eight to your stealth modifier. Plus eight for an uncommon magic item that also allows the color to shift and camouflage into the background, allowing you to hide just about anywhere. Yeah, that's really, really good. I fear any rogue who has this item. I fear any character with proficiency in stealth who has this item, to be truthful. So because of all the power that the Cloak of Elvenkind provides, I'm fairly confident putting it here at spot 71 on the list. And if you're enjoying this series, please consider subscribing, as most of my viewers are not subscribed. The plus two weapon is a powerful thing. Given out usually between levels eight and ten, it signifies the second great leap in power. The plus two weapon ushers in the age when a D&D party, given a full rest, can pretty much take down anything in the monster manual. There are only a select few creatures that can stand up to a full D&D party at this point. And the plus two weapon is partially responsible for this. That plus two with bounded accuracy is the difference between a hit or a miss in many instances. And since a regular plus two weapon doesn't require an attunement slot, it still gives plenty of room for a D&D character to continue to build up their arsenal of powerful magical items. So because of its general versatility, its overall raw power, and a plus two item not requiring an attunement slot, it comes in here at spot number 70 on our list. And this nice item following it up at spot 69 is the plus one shield. Now, you might be asking, why is the plus one shield above the plus one armor? And why is it three spots above the plus one armor? Well, it's very simple. 
The plus one shield can be used with many more characters. A barbarian can rage while having a shield, but they can't rage with heavy armor. That barbarian can also use unarmored defense with a shield, but they can't use that unarmored defense, again, while wearing armor. If you're a dex based fighter and you want a higher AC, but you don't want disadvantage on your stealth checks, well, you're gonna go with a shield. You gain access to more feats and abilities with a shield, like the shield master feat, or the interception fighting style, and overall the shield is just better. You can do so much more with the character if you have a plus one shield. Until the highest levels of D&D, the shield is just the superior option. And since a plus one shield is an uncommon item and a plus one piece of armor is a rare item, you're gonna be able to get this shield much earlier. So because of those reasons, the shield is coming in at number 69. But actually, I've kind of been lying to you because there is a plus one set of armor that does go above the shield. At number 68 is the Elven Chain. And the Elven Chain is above the plus one shield because again, it is so versatile. And it's versatile because it allows spellcasters to have armor. This chain shirt is a DC 14 armor class plus your dexterity modifier maximum of two. However, you are proficient with this armor even if you lack proficiency with medium armor. Inspired by the Lord of Rings mithril armor, this is great if your wizard, sorcerer, warlock, what have you, is really struggling to stay up during combat. Combine Elven Chain with something like the Shield spell, and you can easily get your AC up to 19 or above. And that's high enough to skirt many attacks. And because spellcasters have, on average, the lowest amount of health in the party, on average dodging these attacks are going to be even more significant. The Elven Chain isn't useful for all D&D characters, but the amazing increase in power that it gives spellcasters that don't have proficiency in armor, well, that propels it to spot 68 on the list. And next up is an iconic item, the Dwarven Thrower, or really just Mjolnir from Norse mythology. This item is absolutely fantastic. It's a plus three bonus to attack and damage. It has the throne property. It does an extra 1d8 damage or 2d8 damage versus giants, and it flies back to your hand immediately after you throw it. I'm gonna be brief with this item. If you're a dwarf, you should absolutely get a Dwarven Thrower. It's gonna be one of the absolute best items you can get. Otherwise, you're kind of screwed, because the Dwarven Thrower requires attunement by a Dwarf. If the Dwarven Thrower didn't have that little tagline at the end, you'd be set. But since there's no guarantee that you'll be a Dwarf, the amount of times that you'll see the Dwarven Thrower is rare. And it especially sucks if your DM uses random loot tables and just happens to roll up a Dwarven Thrower when there are no dwarves in a party. I've had that happen to a party that I've played in, and it wasn't great. Everyone was looking at this incredible plus three magic item that they couldn't really use. But if it was open to all races, this would definitely crack the top 20. But for right now, it's sitting at spot number 67 on the list. But next we're going to another instance of power creep. The Wand of the War Mage plus one is a simple uncommon magic item which allows a spellcaster to ignore half cover, but more importantly, allows them to add a plus one to their spell attack rolls. There are many spells that live and die based on their spell attack rolls. Eldritch Blast, Firebolt, Scorching Ray, heck, even Ice Knife has spell attack rolls attached to it. No matter what spellcaster you play, whether you be a bard or a wizard, you're probably going to have at least one spell over the course of playing your character that's going to have a spell attack roll. And since some of these spells with spell attack rolls have additional effects, Wand of the War Mage inherently grows in power. Giving spellcasters this little boost helps them tremendously, especially if there's something like a wildfire druid that adds extra die of damage to some of their spell attack rolls. Or if you're a warlock with Eldritch Blast invocations, whose entire character is built off of Eldritch Blast hitting a target. Wand of the War Mage comes in clutch in so many situations. Say you need to get a chill touch off to stop the healing of an enemy creature. That small, extra chance to hit has so many other implications throughout the entire combat. Wand of the War Mage is being placed so high because of the additional tacked on effects that spells usually have with their to hit rolls. It's not because spells are doing more damage than martial weapon, it's because of those added tacked on effects. Now if you have a sorcerer who's just casting Firebolt, then you're gonna mark this item way way down on the list and put it probably in the 90s. 
But if you have a player that knows what they're doing and is trying to apply status effects throughout the combat, then yeah, this shoots up in power with the aggregate. But let's talk about another powerful magic item at spot 65, the Scimitar of Speed. This very rare magic item is very simple. Not only is it a plus two weapon, but as a bonus action, you can make another melee attack with it. But why is this so good? Well, if you're a rogue with sneak attack and you miss that initial attack, you can bonus action attack again. That failsafe in case you miss that initial attack is very powerful. Missing your one attack a turn with a rogue can be devastating. So a plus two light finesse matched item is fantastic. Or let's look at a paladin. You might be thinking, what, a paladin would never want this? Well, think again. If you're a paladin that is going full smite crazy, which would you rather want? A great sword where you can only make two attacks, or a scimitar where you can make three attacks. As a paladin who focuses on smites instead of casting spells, most of your damage is actually coming from those smites. So while you are losing 2d6 damage on your previous two attacks by not using a great sword, you're gaining an extra 2d8, 3d8, 4d8 damage because you're getting an extra attack that can potentially smite. Or let's say you miss one of those initial attacks. That bonus action gives you the opportunity to get back where you would have been damage-wise. I could go on and on and on how powerful getting this extra attack is. That's partially why I think of haste so highly. Pretty much any character that can do additional damage when they make a melee attack will want a scimitar of speed. At least if the bulk of their damage is coming from things other than the weapon die. Heck, I can probably argue that most barbarians would probably want a scimitar of speed rather than a plus two great axe. But that's a video for another day. Because of the overall effects though of getting that extra melee attack, the scimitar of speed comes in at spot 65. And now going from an item that allows you to attack everything in sight to an item that allows you to see everything in sight. At 64, it's the Robe of Eyes. This robe allows you to become the party's watchdog. It gives you advantage on perception checks that rely on sight. So when you're on guard duty, looking out, making sure no one sneaks up on the party, this item is coming in handy. It's also giving you dark vision. So if you're a human without dark vision, this item again is great. But this item also allows you to see invisible creatures and things in the ethereal plane. You never know when you might need this item, but when you do, when you fight a phase spider or a rakshasa, you can see them coming and alert the rest of the party. If you're playing a high wisdom character whose sole goal is to have a high passive perception and see everything, the robe of eyes is a must for your character. And because of that, it's coming in at spot 64 on this list. But next, we're coming to an item that again seems deceptively simple but for reasons that we previously talked about is incredibly powerful this item at spot 63 is the rare ring of protection the ring of protection does one thing and one thing well it protects you gives you a plus one to your ac and to all saving throws every way that the dm has of doing damage to you or affecting your character you have a better shot in defending yourself. And I think you can guess the initial reason why this item is above the plus one shield or the plus one set of armor, because it's also adding to your saving throw. But it has an additional reason, and I would still put it above the plus one shield even if it didn't affect your saving throw. That's because it can stack with any other item. You can have a shield and you can have a set of armor and you can still have this item. You can be proficient with no armor and no shields and you can still have this item. This item works for literally every character and every single character should want the Ring of Protection. Because of bounded accuracy, that small plus one bonus can go so far. Really, there's not much to say with an item like this because the item ability really speaks for itself once you dig into the core mechanics and design of D&D 5th edition. And we've seen it time and time throughout this list. Those flat bonuses do so much more than a new dungeon master or player would initially believe. And it's one of the biggest reasons why new dungeon masters unbalance their parties unnecessarily, because they don't know the power of just a simple plus one. But now let's go from a simple plus one to a plus two, because at spot 62, we have the Bracers of Archery. At spot 62, we have, again, another simple but powerful item. 
The Bracers of Archery give a plus two to damage rolls made with longbows and shortbows. But in addition, anyone who's attuned to this item gains proficiency in longbows and shortbows. So what does this mean for the average character? Well, if you're a ranged fighter already, you want to pick up this item because of the boost to damage. And that flat boost is more powerful, again, than you would initially think. It takes that D8 damage die and essentially turns it into the equivalent of a D12 damage die, or really a D6 damage die, at least in terms of consistency. Because the less faces on a damage die, the more consistent that damage is. A D12 is very swingy, while a D4 is very solid. Those margins are very different. While you'll be able to deal a higher total damage with a D12, a D8 plus 2 is going to hit that central 6 a lot more consistently. You won't have the highest highs, but you won't have the lowest lows. You can count on a pretty reliable amount of damage. But we also have to take into account that first part of the item you gain proficiency in the longbow and the shortbow. Classes like the rogue or the monk benefit heavily from gaining access to the longbow. They are usually dexterity-based fighters, but don't have access to this additional ranged form of combat. Their natural dexterity pairs extremely well with the longbow, which is a dex weapon. So by giving them access to it, plus an additional damage boost, it turns these classes into, actually, some of the better ranged damage dealers. A rogue with a longbow who uses the aim bonus action from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything can consistently do a high amount of damage from hundreds of feet away. Or you have a monk using that same longbow, and if you pair that with Sharpshooter and the ability to disengage as a bonus action an incredible amount of movement speed, well you're just going to stay away from everything that could potentially damage you. And once you factor in deflect missiles, evasion, dodge action, man you just become impossible to actually hit. I don't think that the monk is that mechanically powerful on its own, but the one time I saw a monk with the Bracers of Archery who went for a sniper build, I was honestly really impressed. It didn't deal the most damage in the world, but it also wasn't able to be hit. So it was an interesting trade-off. So because it helps all classes that want to fight with a longbow or a shortbow, and really increases the effectiveness of a select few classes, I'm putting the Bracers of Archery firmly at spot 62 on this list. And now, at 61, we come to one simple fact. The ability to increase the ability score of your character by a flat amount, no matter what, is incredibly powerful in 5th edition. And if you're something like a barbarian or a fighter, well why wouldn't you pick up the Gauntlets of Ogre Power? This item is somehow an uncommon magic item, and it sets your strength score to 19. Look, if you have your ability to set your strength score in the early game to 19, to late game stats, why wouldn't you? And let's factor in again, if you're going off of random loot tables, this item is going to pop up more often than a lot of other items on this list. And what are the consequences of getting an ability score so high so early? Well, if you don't need to pump strength anymore as a strength-based damage dealer, then you can go right along and start pumping constitution or wisdom or charisma instead. Really whatever stat you want. Not only does this item make your strength damage, your strength saving throws, and your strength ability checks better, but passively, it's going to increase another stat of your choice as well. Items like this have a ripple effect across your character. Look, it's items like these that really make me hesitate to give out just a free, uncommon magic item as a dungeon master. Because when I first started as a dungeon master, I used to say, at first level, just pick an uncommon magic item for your character. But as I've gone through 5th edition, I've begun to realize some of the most powerful magic items are uncommon. It is not safe to give out random uncommon magic items. Items like these here gauntlets are why I don't use random loot tables. Because oopsies, I've just given out a magic item that I've ranked above multiple very rare magic items. But at the end of the day, I think any D&D player worth their salt would affirm that the Gauntlets of Ogre Power are incredibly powerful. If you're a strength-based character and you can get this item before 5th level, you're in great shape. And even getting this item after 5th level is a bargain. Say you're a monk and you're really not prioritizing strength, but you have a free tomb and slot, so why not? Why not become the party's muscle and stronger than 95% of the population just like that? This will without a doubt increase the strength of your D&D character in some way, shape, or form, as long as your strength doesn't exceed 19. What if you wanted to play a dwarf in Dungeons & Dragons, but you didn't want to play a dwarf? 
Well, the people at Wizards of the Coast thankfully thought about this for D&D 5th Edition, and they gave us the Belt of Dwarven Kind. This belt, no matter what, is going to give you a plus 2 to your constitution score to a maximum of 20, and make it so you're better at talking to dwarves. Additionally, you have a 50% chance to grow a beard every day at dawn, and you gain a bunch of other dwarven racial features. This item is great if you're a dwarf, it's great if you're not a dwarf. Any boost to constitution and therefore your health is good. Being able to grow a beard randomly is hilarious. And of course, if you are a race that doesn't have dark vision or resistance to poison, then what's not to love about this item? The way I like to visualize it is that you are getting the benefits of your race, plus the benefits of another race, plus an added plus two to your constitution score. And when you think about it that way, it should be no surprise that the belt of Dwarven Kind sits right here at spot number 60 on this list. But following this up is an item that kills the most dreaded enemy in all of D&D instantly. Now you might be thinking, is he talking about a Beholder? A Dragon? A Tarask? Tiamat? No. I'm talking about doors. If you've played a game in 5th edition, you know that doors can single-handedly stop even the most powerful D&D parties. And so if your players constantly struggle to open doors, then why not invest in the Chime of Opening? This little chime that can be used 10 times can open any door, really any object. As an action, you just point it at an object that needs opening, like a door or a lock or a lid, and then it opens if the sound reaches the object. It undoes one latch or lock at a time, and once the chime is rung 10 times, it is destroyed. So technically, this item is limited. And yes, on stealth missions, the chime can have some downsides and drawbacks. But again, doors opened instantly without a spell slot. This item doesn't even need attunement. I think that speaks for itself, really. If you want something open and you can't get it open, use the chime to get it open. It's a get out of jail free card, really. I think that quite literally any D&D party would want this chime, just in their back pocket. And again, since it requires no attunement slot, any D&D character can pick it up and use it. Which is why it's here at spot number 59 on this list. And following up the chime, at number 58 are the Boots of Speed. Activated with the bonus action, the Boots of Speed double your walking speed, and any creature that makes an opportunity attack against you has disadvantage. No matter if you're a martial character or a mage, if you attack at ranged or up close in melee, the Boots of Speed can help you. If you're a melee character, one of the biggest things that can stop you from doing damage is not being able to get into melee. Don't you hate it when the enemy wizard is more than 30 feet away from you? Fear not, you don't need to waste your action to dash up to them. Instead, use a bonus action, double your movement speed, and get up into range. And the disadvantage on all attacks of opportunity certainly makes this easier. Now if you're a ranged damage dealer or a spellcaster, the last thing you want is to get into melee distance with an enemy. So as a bonus action, you can double your speed and get out of there. That doubled speed means that an enemy can therefore not catch up to you on their subsequent turn. And the disadvantage with the attack of opportunity makes it more likely that you're not going to get hit. If you're in a D&D group that runs very tactical combats, the boots of speed are going to help you tremendously. And even if you're in a more role-playing centric group, how many times has your party or your character needed to rush to get somewhere quickly? When you want to get there in half the amount of time? Look, Sonic the Hedgehog has it right. Going fast is good. And therefore, the Boots of Speed come in at spot number 58. And following this great magic item up is the Sword of Sharpness. At spot 57, the Sword of Sharpness is a very rare item. Now, to the untrained eye, you might be thinking, why is the Sword of Sharpness so good? It doesn't have any bonus to hit or to damage. I mean, it has a bonus to damage against objects, but why is it so good? Well, you do an extra 14 points of slashing damage when you roll a 20 on an attack roll, and then you can roll another d20. And if you roll a 20 again, you lop off one of the target's limbs. I know an extra 14 damage doesn't seem like a lot initially, but have you ever rolled poorly on a critical hit and actually rolled below the damage of a non-critical hit? Like you do 7 damage on a critical, and your next attack you do 9 damage on a non-critical. Well, with the Sword of Sharpness, you're not in any danger of that happening to you. That extra 14 damage is powerful. It's the equivalent of a whole extra attack. And then, of course, you have the small chance of lopping off a limb. And we do have to take that into account, because while it does not happen very often, 
in those magical moments, it still does happen. It's always a memorable moment when you're able to just lop off a random limb with a sort of sharpness. Players will talk about the event for years afterward, even if it's just a simple goblin. But I've had a player use a sword of sharpness and lop off the arm of a Baylor during combat. And that's one of the best moments I've ever been a part of as a DM. And so, for those reasons, the sword of sharpness is coming in at spot 57 on the list. And up next is one of my own personal favorite items. At number 56, another very rare magic item, the Rod of Absorption. The Rod of Absorption is twofold. Firstly, it's a battery for you as a spellcaster. The Rod of Absorption can hold up to 50 spell levels within it. That's a lot of spells. And you can use those spell levels to power your own magic. That's fantastic. That's great. However, its second ability allows you to absorb a spell cast at you. A spell that's only targeting you. But there are a lot of spells that do that. A lot of dangerous spells that do that. And the best thing is, there's no save. With the Rod of Absorption, you can eat a hold person, a disintegrate, a power word kill. Even a counter spell can technically be eaten with the Rod of Absorption because the counter spell is targeting you, the spellcaster. It is an instant I win button versus another spellcaster. So why isn't this item higher? Well, in those very few situations, man, it's really cooking. But how often are you fighting a spellcaster that's targeting a single target spell at you? If you're in a big party especially, you're probably getting hit with fireballs or circle of deaths or lots of area of effect magic. There are limited situations in which you can actually use the reaction, so that decreases its power a little bit. Also, at later levels the Rod of Absorption starts being not as effective because you can only pull a 5th level spell out of the item. So if you want to cast something like Teleport, which is a 7th level spell, you can't actually do that. So that's another constraining factor on the actual item. Now don't get me wrong, it is terrific. And the ability to cast low level spells without fear that you're going to run out of spell slots or not have a spell slot that you need is great. But I can tell you from experience, it's not as broken as you would originally think. Again, don't get me wrong, super powerful. If you have a spellcaster who's constantly running out of spell slots, consider flipping this item to them. Especially if they're a little bit weaker than all the other characters in the party. Maybe they're a new player or something like that. In my opinion, this is one of the best balanced magic items in all of 5th edition. I think the abilities are powerful, but they're also limited in just the right ways to not make them broken. I think it deserves the very rare rarity because you don't want to see rods of absorption around everywhere. However, when you get it, it's enough of a boon that it deserves that rarity. It's a magic item that really changes the way that you play without breaking the overall power scaling between characters. It rewards thoughtful use without making it so one player shoots ahead of the rest of the party and makes others feel obsolete. I hope that moving into the future we see more design like this. And for that reason, the Rod of Absorption is sitting pretty at spot 56. But next up, this is a must-have item for all barbarians and monks, in my opinion. If you're a character that doesn't wear any armor, the Bracers of Defense are invaluable. This is one of the few ways that characters who don't wear armor can actually increase their AC. And usually the plus two bonus brings them in line with all the other frontline fighters in the party. At least if you're a barbarian or a monk, who are the main two classes that are going to make use of this item. It's hard for me to say anything else other than this is just really strong. And while I do recommend that barbarians and monks go after this item specifically, other users, like wizards, can make a lot of use out of this. Combine bracers of defense with mage armor and you have a pretty tanky wizard or sorcerer. The Bracers of Defense though are below other items that give a plus 2 to AC because you're already at an AC disadvantage when you need them. If you're a wizard or a sorcerer, you shouldn't really be caring about your AC that much because you shouldn't be getting hit. You need to stay out of the front and midline and get to safety. And if you're a Barbarian, you should have many defensive capabilities to keep you in the fight. You usually have the hit points to take those hits. And Monk, well, uh, I, the Monk is its just a mess of a class, but I suppose that you do have Dodge and Disengage as a bonus action, although it's fueled by key points. You, you shouldn't be getting hit all that much as well as a Monk. You're not really a frontline fighter, but you're not really a midline fighter. You're a striker. It's weird. 
pretty much if you need this item you're already at a bit of a disadvantage and ac probably shouldn't be your first priority but if you are in a situation where you can boost your ac it's still always nice and lord knows that if you're a barbarian or a monk who is getting hit all the time you do want a small boost to your ac and so for that reason at spot 55 we have the bracers of defense but leapfrogging these bracers at spot 54 we have the Wand of Magic Missiles. The Wand of Magic Missiles is an uncommon item that has seven charges. For each charge that you use to cast the Magic Missile spell that this wand provides, you increase the spell's level by one. Now, why is this uncommon wand that at maximum allows you to cast Magic Missile at, what, seventh level, so high up on the list? Well, because it requires attunement, but it doesn't specify a spellcaster. One of the banes of a lot of melee characters is that if a creature's flying or is out of their range, they can't do anything. Well, this uncommon magic item gives them the ability to no matter what deal damage at range. This damage isn't going to miss, it's always going to hit, doesn't scale off of any other modifier. It's simple, easy to use, and a good fix. Why would I force my fighter to use a javelin when I can just give them this wand? I promise you, if you're in a campaign when you are constantly fighting enemies that stay out of your range, you are going to want this magic item. It's well worth the attunement slot. Or if you don't need it, you can just give it to an NPC follower, no matter what skill level they are, and have them just cast magic missile throughout the combat. It's a one-size-fits-all, good damage-dealing weapon. You're not going to compete for damage with dedicated range damage dealers, however you don't need to. This is going to allow you to do respectable damage no matter what. And it's that versatility combined with its uncommon status that puts it here at spot 54. Instead of using javelins, go after this item. But next up, we have another flying item, and this is the carpet of flying. You know what's better than flying alone? Flying with friends. Depending on its size, the carpet of flying can lift up to 800 pounds into the air. The bigger the carpet, the slower it is, but group flying is powerful. You'd be shocked at how many characters in the monster manual don't have a way to attack flying creatures. If you're just traveling along the landscape, and you're at third level, and you see a Tarrasque running at you, all you need to do is go 60 feet up into the air, and you win. You beat the Tarrasque. It doesn't have any way to deal ranged damage. In a dungeon, is this going to be as helpful? No, but for long distance traveling, the carpet of flying is great because it has no limit to the time it can stay in the air while flying. Since the carpet does not need attunement, you could technically have people alternate flying the carpet the entire trip. And as the item says, it can technically carry double its carrying weight. It's just that the carpet is going to fly at half speed. So if you have a party of four, you can definitely get away with a smaller carpet and still use it to fly across your campaign world. It makes traveling safer, easier, and also DMs. If you don't want to have to plan random encounters and can just hand wave combat to you get there, just give them a carpet of flying. And you might say, well, I don't want to give them infinite flying everywhere. I say that's fine. Your campaign world can have these little way stations along the road that basically allow these carpets to fly along them, but if you're off-road, then they don't work. Just a little bit of world building can solve the problem pretty quickly. But just as the bag of holding just helps with the day-to-day -day logistics of D&D, so does the carpet of flying. After, say, 5th or 6th level when the party is beginning to journey out of their local area, I highly recommend giving them the carpet of flying. Don't give the carpet too late, like around 13th level, because then they're going to have access to lots of teleportation magic, and then they're not going to need to use the carpet of flying, and it's just going to sit idle. But because of all the use that the carpet of flying can give, it sits at spot 53 on this list. And next up on the list, if you're ready to be afraid, is the Mace of Terror. And this mace is very simple. You spend an action, and every creature of your choice within 30 feet needs to make a wisdom saving throw or be frightened of you. And while frightened in this way, the creature can't take reactions, and it must use its action to dash away from you on its turns. Why is the Mace of Terror so good? because the Mace of Terror swings the action economy in your favor. Because yes, the Mace of Terror might only work for one turn on some creatures, but that's one turn when they're not attacking you. Since most D&D combats only last for about three rounds, this is a significant swing in the tempo of the combat. You can theoretically quote unquote outnumber an enemy that has superior numbers to you with the Mace of Terror for one turn. But really, if you're fighting creatures with terrible wisdom saves, this can last for multiple rounds. And in many situations, the Mace of Terror can give you additional attacks.
attacks because the creatures can only take the dash action. They can't take the disengage action, opening them up to attacks of opportunities. With a high wisdom save DC and a powerful effect, the Mace of Terror can quite literally save parties from impossible combats. Don't underestimate the power of this item to completely swing the tides of battle in your favor. If you have the chance to pick up the Mace of Terror, do it. You never know when you're going to need the ability to send your enemies screaming for the hills. But now let's transition from an item that is going to magically terrify your enemies to an item that's going to terrify your enemies based on the amount of damage you'll be able to do to them. At least if their name's on the ammo. Because at spot 51, we have the Arrow of Slaying. Surprise, we actually have more ammunition on this list. But it's very, very special ammunition. Ammunition that I had to do a lot of research on to confirm some theories about it. So Arrows of Slaying are built to slay very specific things. They can be as broad or specific as the DM wants. But if a target belongs to the specific group that the Arrow of Slaying is biased against, then they have to make a DC 17 constitution saving throw when they're hit or take 6d10 damage when they're struck or half as much on a successful save. So no matter what, you're doing more damage. And better yet, this ammunition does not stop being magical once it's fired. It stops being magical when it deals the extra damage. So if you're fighting a dragon, you have three arrows of slaying, and you recover all the arrows that you missed and you keep firing, you are always going to be able to output 18 d10 damage. Now, this damage might be halved if the dragon is saving, but that's still a lot of damage. And if you're prepared with arrows of slaying as you're going into a big fight, you can absolutely eradicate your chosen enemies. But why are the arrows of slaying here? They're very rare magic items, so aren't they rare? Yes and no. So if you're in a homebrew game, run and written by your DM, arrows of slaying are all right. You don't really know if they're gonna be useful. Hopefully your DM throws enemies at you that can be hurt by the arrows of slaying, but honestly, who knows? Now let's look at written adventures and adventures league modules. I went through and I looked for instances of the Arrows of Slaying. And sure enough, without fail, when they appear in the modules, you are getting ready to fight that creature which the arrows can affect. And you're usually getting a lot of these arrows, like 10 arrows. So in pre-written adventures, the Arrows of Slaying are pretty much always going to be useful. Since a lot of players play in these types of games, in pretty much every example, the Arrows of Slaying are going to be useful. And you're being given a lot of them. Now, I didn't go through and I didn't do this with every single item on this list, of course. But when looking at this particular consumable magic item, you're pretty much always going to find some use in them, at least in the pre-written stuff. And even if the game is from your DM's mind and creation, you can probably still find uses for these arrows. And because they're on very, very few random roll tables, they're pretty much always going to be tailored for what's going next. And the damage is just so good. They can completely reorient a combat, because three arrows of slaying on average should be doing about 99 damage. With most things like dragons having about 150 to 200 hit points, that is a massive swing. So because of the raw power that the arrow of slaying possesses, yeah, I feel distinctly confident at placing it at spot 51 on this list. And at number 50, exactly halfway on the list, the Helm of Teleportation. This rare magic item can allow a group three free teleportation casts per day. And this item is so powerful for two specific reasons. One, it completely opens up your campaign world. You can travel instantly between places on a map. Now, if the party hasn't been to that specific place before, there's a chance that you could go off target. However, because the Helm of Teleportation regains 1d3 charges daily at dawn, the party can continually keep trying to teleport to their intended location. Now, this is a double-edged sword for me as a dungeon master. Because on one hand, the number of random encounters that you're going to be able to throw out your party is probably going to go down. Because they're not going to be wandering the wilderness and traveling between unknown places as frequently as they used to. However, now I can make quest objectives farther apart. And a party can teleport between those quest objectives. But secondly, the Helm of Teleportation is so powerful because it's a TPK saver. Someone wearing the Helm of Teleportation can get the party out of trouble. Giving a Helm of Teleportation to a rogue or a really tanky barbarian 
allows them to save the party if they're about to lose a combat. Because if the main spellcaster goes down, and you don't have another way of escaping the combat, the Helm of Teleportation can come into play. I've actually played in a few D&D campaigns with the Helm of Teleportation, and you'd be surprised just how often the party uses this to flee encounters that would otherwise TPK them. A smart party can use the Helm of Teleportation as a get-out-of-jail-free card, and for that reason the Helm of Teleportation comes in at number 50 on the list. And at number 49, it's a bit of a no-brainer item. And when I was first learning the 5e system, I was confused because I thought there is no way that this item should be uncommon. And now, all these years later, I am still thinking there is no way this item should be uncommon. I'm talking about the adamantine armor. I think anyone can agree that the adamantine armor is powerful. Being able to say no to all critical hits, that's absolutely fantastic. And to be able to say no to critical hits without having to use an attunement slot, that makes it even better. Plus, with the adamantine armor being an uncommon magic item, you're going to be seeing it more often in your D&D campaigns. And as a forever DM, the adamantine armor just sucks the joy out of me sometimes. Because I like getting critical hits on players too. I like it when my enemies do cool things and when the fighter just tells me, actually DM, no, it's not a critical hit because of that armor I found seven sessions ago. Well, I get that deep pit in my stomach and I go, yeah, yeah, this is a powerful magic item. And you know what? More often than not, it's the item that keeps the frontline fighter up in many combats. Critical hits can swing the battle into the favor of one side or the other. It makes it hard to predict whether you're safe or not from going down due to damage. And this adamantine armor helps to smooth out those fluctuations. So because of all that, the adamantine armor is coming in at spot number 49. And coming up next is a magic item that I don't hear talked about often enough at all. Not only is it powerful mechanically, but from a role-playing perspective, it offers you so many unique choices. So because of all the security it provides, the Rod of Security is coming in at spot number 48. The Rod of Security makes taking rests easy. You and up to 199 other creatures can enter an extra planar paradise. Essentially, if you and your D&D party are walking through a dungeon or another hostile environment, the Rod of Security provides one free long rest every 10 days. Imagine you and your friends are depleted as you're about to walk into a boss fight. Well, you can simply slam down the Rod of Security, take a long rest, and have no fear of being attacked while you're resting. Now, this doesn't help if you're under a time crunch, but more often than not, you can find a use for the Rod of Security. But like I said when I first introduced the Rod of Security, that's only half of its benefit. The person who wields the Rod of Security gets to choose the form of the Paradise. Maybe the Paradise looks like their home village, or a forest they visited once with the party. It could be a tropical island, a carnival. The item literally says whatever else you can imagine. The role-playing opportunities feel limitless when you have the Rod of Security. So for a roleplay heavy party, this is an item that I recommend to all Dungeon Masters. But now going from an item that isn't talked about a lot to one of the most famous D&D magic items, at number 47 we have the Flame Tongue Sword. What D&D character doesn't want a sword that's on fire? With a simple bonus action you can turn a long sword, short sword, great sword into a flaming blade. This blade does an additional 2d6 fire damage and sheds its bright light. Frankly, a Flame Tongue Sword is just a damage buff to any character who takes it. More often than not, a frontline character is going to be able to make use of this blade. The only downside really is the fire damage that it does because many creatures in D&D 5th edition are immune or resistant to fire damage. However, if you're not fighting devils or demons all the time, or ancient red dragons, you'll still be doing that extra damage with your Flame Tongue Sword. So because of its style, damage, and iconic nature, the Flame Tongue Longsword is coming in at spot number 47. But another sword comes in at 46. A sword that can kill a creature, well, potentially instantly. This is the Nine Lives Stealer. If you're a creature with 100 hit points or less, well then you're in danger when the Nine Lives Stealer comes to reap your soul. The ability to kill a creature instantly if it has 100 hit points or fewer, well that's a power that's not to be trifled with. Its DC 15 constitution saving throw, while not exceptionally high, does often get the job done. And even if you don't get that sweet, sweet insta-kill at all while you're using your 9 lives stealer, it's still a plus 2 weapon. Never underestimate a weapon that can instantly kill a foe in D&D 5th edition. And because the 9 lives stealer can do that, it comes in at spot number 46 on the list. But now at 45, let's turn to an item with a bit more explosive potential. I'm talking about the Necklace of Fireballs. Now you might be asking, why did I go with the Necklace of Fireballs over the Wand of Fireballs? 
Because the necklace of fireballs is a consumable item, technically, eventually you're going to run out of beads on the necklace to throw. While the wand of fireballs, the charges are regained. And the answer to that is simple. The necklace of fireballs is usable by everyone. The wand of fireballs requires your character to be a spellcaster. But giving a barbarian or a rogue the ability to chuck fireballs? That opens up tactical possibilities in combat. One of the biggest counters to martial characters is hordes of enemies. A martial character only has so many attacks per action and therefore can get overwhelmed by hordes. But giving them the ability to drop a fireball if things get dicey? Well now they're really cooking. And in that context, I would much rather go with the Necklace of Fireballs. Because other spellcasters that don't have Fireball have other AoE attack spells. Yes, a bard doesn't have something like Fireball naturally, but they have things like Hypnotic Pattern. A druid has Ice Storm. Other spellcaster classes have their own AoEs. Therefore, I think that you're getting much more value with the Necklace of Fireballs. And so that's why it's coming in at spot number 45 on the list. But coming up next is one of the better staves in all of D&D 5th edition. This is the Staff of Thunder and Lightning. At spot 44, the Staff of Thunder and Lightning gets you a lot of bang for your buck. It gives you 5 properties that can all be used once per day. And while the Staff of Thunder and Lightning can be used by a spellcaster, it doesn't need to be. I actually find that the Staff of Thunder and Lightning is best used by classes like the Monk, as that class can make use of a magical quarterstaff better than pretty much any other. But pretty much any character that gets the Staff of Thunder and Lightning is going to benefit from it. Whether that be extra melee damage, the ability to stun a creature, or dropping a lightning bolt from the sky, this staff is a Swiss army knife. So since you're getting a plus 2 magical quarter staff with 5 different unique features, I think it's completely fair to put the Staff of Thunder and Lightning here on the list. So what's better than the Staff of Thunder and Lightning? Well at number 43, plus 2 armor. Like I've said before, bounded accuracy is very very good. And using my regular ranking system, I'd rather have a plus 2 set of armor than all the before mentioned items on the list. Just because it makes that big of an impact on bounded accuracy. But what's better than not getting hit at all? Well it's getting hit and taking 0 damage. At spot number 42 we have the Ring of Evasion. The Ring of Evasion is very simple. When you fail a dexterity saving throw, you can burn a charge and you can succeed instead. I know that doesn't sound like a lot. But for certain characters, this makes all the difference. Say you're a character with a terrible dexterity score and you're fighting a red dragon. Succeeding on a dexterity save might mean you're taking 20, 30, 40 less damage. Dexterity saves are one of the most common saves in all of D&D 5th edition. So your character just having 3 automatic successes is extremely powerful. And if you give this item to a rogue or a monk, some kind of class with evasion, this means that they can take 0 damage from dexterity saves. Because they take 0 damage on a success. As you guys should know by now if you've watched this far into the series, I am a big fan of items that are useful for all characters. Situational items are nice, but I prefer an item that everyone can use. And no character will be upset if they get the Ring of Evasion. But next up at 41 is an item that only spellcasters can use. But it is so good that I had to put it this high on the list. At number 41 we have the Pearl of Power. The Pearl of Power gives you an additional 3rd or lower level spell slot. And since the Pearl of Power is an uncommon magic item, you're going to be able to find it earlier on in your D&D campaigns. And at lower levels, spellcasters really struggle with having enough spell slots. The Pearl of Power can be a godsend in many situations. The Pearl of Power is a free revivify, it's a free fireball, it's a free healing word. Or if you're a warlock and spell slots are at a premium, a Pearl of Power is basically anything that you want. I cannot stress this enough, if you're playing a warlock, lock, pick up a Pearl of Power if you can find it. It might literally double the number of spell slots that you have. So seriously, if you're a spellcaster at low levels, I beg you, hunt out a Pearl of Power. Did you know that there's only one artifact in all of base D&D 5th edition? And that's the Orb of Dragonkind, which comes in at spot number 40 on the list. The Orb of Dragonkind has a lot of abilities. It has an arsenal of useful spells attached to it like Cure Wounds, Daylight, Death Ward, Scrying, and Detect Magic. In addition, as this is the Orb of Dragonkind, as an action you can use this artifact to call all dragons within 40 miles of you. Well, all evil dragons. And technically dragon deities like Tiamat don't need to answer the call. Finally, this orb, like many artifacts in 5th edition, have random properties. 
you get two minor beneficial properties, one minor detrimental property, and one major detrimental property. You can find the list of these properties in the DM's guide. Now this item has a bunch of downsides like its detrimental properties or the fact that you can be charmed by the orb when you try to attune to it. But this orb has an arsenal of great spells and the two minor benefits aren't anything to scoff at. I actually think the minor benefit list in the DMG is really good. And really depending on what you roll this item can move up or down on the list. So I settled on a nice middle ground and gave the orb of dragonkind the 40th spot on our list. Next up though, we're talking about armor with the Dwarven Plate. Essentially with this item you're getting a plus two set of plate armor, already pretty good. And on top of this, if you're moved against your will, you can use a reaction to reduce that distance by 10 feet. I know this doesn't sound like a whole lot, but sometimes 10 feet is the difference between getting shoved into lava and being safe. I've seen this feature come in clutch so many times over my years DMing. Dwarven Plate is fantastic, and what many players get wrong is that you don't actually need to be a dwarf to wear this armor. Magic armor in D&D grows and shrinks to fit the wearer. So no matter if you're a dwarf or a fairy or the biggest goliath, the Dwarven Plate is right for you. Which is why it comes in at spot number 39 on the list. And we're going to start making a little bit of a run on armor now, as we're going to jump to the plus two shield. There's not a lot I have to say about the plus two shield. It's better than the plus one shield. And for the previously mentioned reasons, I would take a plus two shield over a plus two set of armor. Although it was really close between the dwarven plate and the plus two shield. But because the dwarven plate has a strength requirement of 15, the plus two shield just barely inches forward on our list. However, the plus two shield at spot 38 cannot beat the animated shield at spot number 37. What makes the animated shield so good? I mean, yes, as a bonus action, you can animate the shield and allow it to float in place, leaving your hands free. But other than that, it's just a regular shield. Why is an item that gives an overall plus four not better than an item that gives an overall plus two? Well, because the animated shield can be used with characters that wield two-handed weapons. Like I've been saying through this series, I value items that have versatility across many kinds of characters. Anyone from a frontline barbarian to the squishy wizard can use the animated shield. I particularly like giving this animated shield towards the end of campaigns to great weapon wielding fighters or barbarians or paladins. Simply put, this is the shield for characters that can't use a shield. And because of that, the animated shield comes in at spot number 37. So now we're going to take a break from armor and start to talk about wands. And our first wand is the Wand of the War Mage plus two. Once again, with these flat bonuses, I don't have much to say. This item is excellent, and all spellcasters are always hunting after a Wand of the War Mage. This item is the wizard's version of a plus two weapon. But because it helps so much with the wizard's spells, it's going to come in at spot number 36. And at spot number 35, the Wand of Polymorph. This wand has a whopping seven charges, and you only need to expend one as an action to cast Polymorph, with a hefty save DC of 15. Polymorph, as many of you know, is one of the better spells in 5th edition. Not only does it have uses in combat, but it has uses as a utility spell. Really, one of the only problems with the spell is that it uses a 4th level spell slot. Since many D&D groups don't get to the higher echelons of play, a 4th level spell slot is a valuable resource. To be able, at this weapon's maximum capacity, cast Polymorph 7 times? That's a huge swing in power, and it also really opens up the utility options for the party. A spellcaster with this item can really start to change the dynamics of any combat they're a part of. All of a sudden, the half-orc fighter at one hit point becomes a raging Tyrannosaurus Rex. Or, in a Hail Mary play, the wizard casts the polymorph using this wand and turns the BBEG into a duck. The versatility and usefulness of Polymorph can't be overstated, and having seven uses of that spell stored within this wand is kind of absurd, which is why the Wand of Polymorph comes in at spot number 35. And next up comes one of the items that really trips up newer DMs. That's the Cloak of Protection at spot number 34. I actually have no idea why this is an uncommon item. As we've talked about in D&D 5th edition, a plus one is extremely impactful to the overall dynamics of game balancing. So why an uncommon item gives a plus one to your AC and to all saving throws is beyond me. I mean, look, you probably already know what I'm going to say about this item. Every character wants to have it. Every character can use it. 
it's an uncommon magic item, so you're going to be finding it more often on roll tables. Ideally, this item's going to cost less. But I'll be very frank, I make sure the Cloak of Protection is a very rare item in my games. And when it's sold, it has a price tag to match. However, players are still willing to pay that price because the Cloak of Protection is so good. And that's why it's so high on the list. And next up is the cousin of the animated shield, the Dancing Sword, at spot number 33. As a bonus action, you can activate this blade and it's going to start hovering in the air. As part of that bonus action, you can order the sword to attack a target. And then on subsequent turns, you can use a bonus action to have the sword move and attack. After the sword makes four attacks, it flies back to your hand. Or if your hands are full or you're unconscious, it falls to the ground. Of course, being able to get an extra attack for any D&D character is really good. But an extra attack with a sword, an extra melee attack with a sword is really good. Because it procs a bunch of other character abilities. You can use Divine Smite with this sword. This sword benefits from a Barbarian's Rage. This sword benefits from Hunter's Mark. For characters with limited attacks, so not getting higher than two attacks, like Paladins and Barbarians and Rangers, the Dancing Sword is so good. And even your average fighter is definitely going to pick up a Dancing Sword. A pro tip with this weapon, if you're a Druid, you can activate the sword and then Wild Shape. Since your physical ability scores will change, this sword will use the physical ability score of your wild shape. So let's say you're a moon druid and you've transformed into a woolly mammoth, or an earth elemental. Well, this sword is going to be hitting just as hard as if a fighter were wielding it. It's a fantastic combination. And I'm sure that there are so many more ways to put the dancing sword to great use. And so for that reason, the dancing sword is coming in at spot 33. And the next item, huh, if you thought that the Cloak of Protection was bad, I have no fucking idea how the Stone of Good Luck is also an uncommon item. This little stone gives a plus one to all ability checks and saving throws. Yes, you heard me, all ability checks and saving throws. And it's an uncommon item. I think this speaks to just how powerful the rest of the items are on this list. We're crossing a threshold, everybody. The rest of the items on this list I would rather take than a plus one to all my ability checks and a plus one to all my saving throws. So that should say something. And if you find a stone of good luck at first level, I don't care what the price is, you need to buy it. Pool all your party resources together. Because quite literally, this is an uncommon item that can stay with you until 20th level. It is ridiculously good. And the next item is even better. What's better than a luck stone? A lucky fortress. Instant fortress at spot number 31 is a hilarious item. Once you've placed a one inch metal cube on the ground and speak its command word as an action, the cube will rapidly grow into a whole fortress. This two-story fortress is perfect for all your adventuring needs. Not only does it give you a defensible position to rest overnight, but it can also do 10d10 bludgeoning damage to any creature that was in the fortress's space when it appeared. Now I have to say a few things about the fortress. It specifically says the cube must be on the ground. So you can't throw the cube and have the fortress land on creatures midair. Additionally, the fortress is never going to crush any creatures. The text specifically says that a creature is pushed to an unoccupied space outside the fortress. However, that doesn't mean that this fortress isn't really good. Because despite its limitations, the fortress can save you from TPKs. Ambushed by bandits, activate the fortress, run inside. Or have the fortress appear on a bunch of enemies. And there's also the fact that this fortress acts as a home away from home. It can act as like this mobile home base. The Instant Fortress can act as a signature item for any D&D party that you give it to. It's also a driving force for stories that are going to be told for years afterward. And let's be honest, just popping a fortress out whenever is really cool. Which is why the fortress comes in at spot number 31 on the list. Up next we have the Periapt of Wound Closure, and I can actually understand why this powerful item is an uncommon. This item keeps characters alive. It stabilizes you when you're in the dying state and you gain double the amount of hit points when you expend a hit die if you have a new group of players or a group of players that are super attached to their characters in a roleplay focus group. I would recommend giving them the Periapt of Wound Closure. With this Periapt, you're never going to have that heartbreaking situation of rolling a natural one on a death save and then boom, you're dead. This takes a lot of stress and pressure out of combat. Now maybe you're in a gaming group that really likes that additional stress and pressure in those really intense tactical combats, but for a lot of groups, that's not why you play. 
For one group I ran, I gave everyone a periapt of wound closure and it did not require attunement. They just wanted to roleplay their characters and have combats every now and then. That group didn't really want character death on the table. This item dramatically reduces the stress of the players during combat, and I personally think it's one of the best designed magic items in D&D 5th edition. I wish DMs gave this item out more to certain parties. Examples being parties without a dedicated healer or parties that just want to roleplay. To be quite honest, for some classes I think that the Periapt of Wound Closure could be a starting item. I'm looking at classes like the Wizard or Matt Mercer's Bloodhunter. So if you're a Dungeon Master watching this, please consider giving out this Periapt of Wound Closure. You don't even need to give it to all your players, but just giving this one magic item to the right player at the right time can drastically improve their D&D experience. So yeah, the Periapt of Wound Closure comes in at spot number 30. And at spot 29 is one of the most coveted magic items for any spellcaster in 5th edition, the Staff of Power. Honestly, I'm just going to allow you to read everything that the Staff of Power can do. This is a signature item for any sorcerer, warlock, or wizard. From the bonus to armor, saving throws, and attack rolls, to all the spells that they're going to get in their retributive strike in the worst case scenario. If you're going to the final arc of a campaign, consider giving out this item. The Staff of Power really shows just how far a character has come. And every wizard needs their staff. In fact, I like to go a little bit further with my Staffs of Power. I like to think about the spells that the character has used the most throughout the campaign. Then I load the Staff of Power up with a few of those spells. Maybe this character loves to use the spell Rope Trick all the time. Well, that character's Staff of Power will come with Rope Trick instead of Levitate. I found that these small touches really help to elevate what a Staff of Power is in the eyes of a player. And really, just the name of this item says it all, Staff of Power. I like to think of it as a signal that the character has arrived, that they've become a legendary hero or villain. I can't recommend the Staff of Power enough. Just make sure you don't give it out too early because it is an extremely powerful magic item. And next, continuing our theme of power, comes the plus three weapon. Well, why is the plus three weapon so good? Well, it's the pinnacle of a martial character. That additional plus three to hit is essentially an extra 15% chance to hit. Characters with plus three weapons rarely miss. Additionally, that plus three to damage adds up over time. By the end of a combat, it's like you took an extra two or three swings with your weapon, compared to if you just had a regular weapon. Additionally, there are many items in D&D 5th edition, like artifacts, that can only be destroyed with a plus three magical weapon. In some adventures, certain doors or objects or people can only be killed with a plus three magical weapon. Obviously, no spoilers. But that plus three means something. It is the sword of a mythic hero. It is to a fighter what the staff of power is to a wizard. So not only does it have this mechanical significance, but it has role-playing significance. No matter what, I make sure my plus three weapons are named. Even if I'm just giving out a base plus three weapon, just the fact that it's plus three means it gets a cool name. It's a weapon that people have heard about before. Now of course there are better weapons and we'll see them on this list, but a plus three magic weapon just has this certain awe to them. Even after running D&D for so many years, I still get giddy when I either get or give out a plus three weapon, which is why it comes in here at spot number 28 on the list. And next up we essentially have the D&D version of a Swiss army knife. Additionally, this is the first legendary item on this list. At spot number 27, the Rod of Lordly Might. Once again, I'm just going to allow you to read this item. Now TLDR, this is a plus three magic weapon with nine different features attached to it. This is what a legendary weapon should be. I can completely see an entire adventure built around getting this item. Simply put, if you need this rare legendary magic item to put in a random dungeon for your party to go find, the Rod of Lordly Might is never a bad choice. Better yet, this magic item will not break the game. If you give a player the Rod of Lordly Might, yes, they'll be powerful, but not so powerful that they're going to outshine the rest of the party members. Are they going to have a lot of fun toys to play around with? Yes, of course. But by no means are you completely screwed balance-wise if you give this item out. And whichever player gets this item is going to be very happy. Towards the end of a campaign, if you have a player who's proven themselves to be really good at outside-the-box thinking or really wanting to use everything at their disposal to solve problems, 
giving them the Rod of Lordly Might is a great idea. Creative players can benefit so much from it. From it being able to transform into a 50-foot climbing pole, to a battery ram, to a flame tongue longsword. In my personal opinion, the Rod of Lordly Might never gets old. Which is why it's here at spot number 27 on the list. And now the best bow in D&D 5th edition. If you have an archer character in your party, you should be looking for the Oath Bow. Firstly, before we get into this weapon, I need you to understand just how cool the flavor for this thing is. Whenever you knock an arrow with this bow, it whispers swift death to my enemies. And you just say a command phrase to activate the effect. This item kind of steps outside the game. It puts the mechanics to the side for a moment and really allows a player to embrace the role-playing elements. This item has been a huge hit in roleplay heavy groups, and to be quite fair, in more tactical groups as well. Once you mark an enemy with your oath bow, you have advantage on attack rolls to hit them, they gain no benefits from cover, besides total cover of course. You have no disadvantage at long range, you do an extra 3d6 piercing damage. This is the boss killer bow. Your archer uses this on a boss and they die very quickly. However, for how powerful the oath bow is, it does have a downside. You see, you can only have one sworn enemy at a time. That status of sworn enemy only ends after seven days or when that enemy dies. If you use your sworn enemy ability on a little goblet and they just happen to get away, and you're not able to find them, well, you have lost access to that feature for seven days. Depending on how your DM handles time, that could be a long time out of game. That could be multiple sessions. So you have to be careful with the Oath Bow. However, its benefit against your sworn enemy is just so good that it has to come in at spot number 26 on this list. And next up, another legendary item, the Scarab of Protection. This item has two abilities. The first is advantage on saving throws against all spells. The second is that when you fail a save against a necromancy spell or a spell from an undead, like a lich, you can use your reaction to spend a charge and turn the failed save into a successful one. When this item runs out of charges, it is destroyed. Definitely a powerful item. And like the Rod of Lordly Might, this is an item that you can safely give at the end of an arc or a long quest line. It's not going to break your game, but it is definitely a powerful magical item. It is also, in my mind, a BBEG Slayer. For all of you homebrew DMs out there, have you ever created a villain so powerful that you have no idea how your party is going to defeat them? This is how you do it. Particularly if they're a lich. Because remember, a lich is an undead creature. And if your party just keeps on using their reactions, they'll never fail a save from that lich. Now of course, it's going to be a hard fight, but no longer an impossible one. It also allows parties of a significantly lower level to stand a chance against significantly higher CR undead enemies. When used in the right campaign, this item is just mwah, chef's kiss. But now moving on to another one of my favorite items at spot number 24, the Ring of Telekinesis. This ring is very simple. It allows you to cast the spell Telekinesis at will. Its one restriction is that you can only target objects that aren't being worn or carried. But that is certainly enough. The Ring of Telekinesis provides so much utility for any D&D party. Being able to lift a metric ton on a whim is a powerful ability. This ring allows for a lot of creative solutions to problems. Think of this item as a super mage hand. While this item does have a few limitations, it is certainly not one to forget. And quite honestly, any item that allows you to cast a 5th level spell at will is probably pretty good. Which is why we have the Ring of Telekinesis this high on the list. Now moving on from the Ring to the Stones. It's the Ioun Stones at spot number 23 on the list. I'll be honest here, if I counted all the Ioun Stones separately, they would have just flooded this entire list. Ranging from rare to legendary, the Ioun Stones are always a delight whenever they're found. From boosting ability scores to absorbing spells, these Ioun Stones really do do it all. I don't have time to talk about each and every Ioun Stone, but a majority of them are so good that I have to put them at spot number 23 on the list. Always keep your eye out for them. And DMs, give out some more Ioun Stones. They're so much fun. And yet leapfrogging these stones at spot number 22 is a plus 3 shield. Look, let's just be very frank about what the plus 3 shield is. It's a plus 5 to your AC, with no attunement slot required. It's more versatile than armor, and is incredibly powerful. It is a fantastic item. However, eagle-eyed viewers, you're probably aware now that this is the first time that the shield has come in second place to the armor. 
Why, at this stage, has the plus three armor leapfrog the plus three shield? Well, we'll talk about that in greater detail further down the list. And now, at spot number 21, another shield, in fact, the best shield in base D&D 5th edition, the Spellguard shield. While holding this shield, you have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects, and spell attack rolls have disadvantage against you. For martial characters that really struggle against spellcasters, whether it's because they keep on failing their saving throws, or because they just can't get within range because of all that blistering firepower that spellcasters have in 5th edition, the Spellguard Shield is the answer. And it solves a problem that I have with a lot of these items, which is that it only affects spells and not other magical effects. Because depending on the campaign, you might not encounter very many spellcasters. Therefore, that other magical effects tag at the very end drastically increases the power of this item. While this is technically only a basic shield, I would sacrifice the plus 3 to AC that the plus 3 shield gives me in a heartbeat to gain the spell guard shield. This is a game-changing piece of hardware that you can give to any of your martial characters. DMs, you should instantly notice a jump in that character's power. And I'll be honest here, this item is at the very edge of being broken, in my opinion. Coming in at spot number 20, the immovable rod is truly an iconic magic item. And at first glance, this magic item looks so incredibly simple. As an action, the rod fixes itself in place. It can hold up to 8,000 pounds and can only be moved up to 10 feet on a DC 30 strength check. For creative players, the immovable rod is a dream item. It can hold doors closed, rip open the stomachs of monsters that have consumed you, act as a makeshift climbing tool. The immovable rod is limited only by your imagination. And an item of this power becomes even more ridiculous when you realize it doesn't require attunement. There is no reason not to pick up this powerful magic item. But moving on from the immovable rod, coming in at 19th place is the Defender Sword. Defender is a plus three sword, sometimes. Because when you first attack on each one of your turns, you can decide whether that plus three goes into your attack rolls with the sword, your AC, or a mix of the two. I love this item because it's incredibly adaptable depending on the situations of a character. However, it can drastically affect how you balance encounters. A regular paladin with plate armor and a shield in the defensive fighting style can easily get an AC of 24 or higher when they're wielding defender. This one item can output brutal amounts of damage while also increasing the tanking ability of a character. Having seen multiple characters from rogues to fighters to paladins pick up a defender sword, I can well and truly say that this has a massive impact on your D&D sessions. So give this sword its due. And that's why Defender is coming in at spot number 19 on the list. Now coming in at spot number 18 is the big brother of the Staff of Power, the Staff of the Magi. Simply put, this is just a better Staff of the Magi. It gives you advantage on saving throws against spells while also being able to absorb some of those spells and in addition to that, having a huge arsenal of spells that you can cast with this staff. This is the pinnacle of a spellcaster's staff in 5th edition. A character outfitted with the Staff of the Magi can easily go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything you have to offer, and they will instantly outshine any other spellcasters that are within the party. Giving a character the Staff of the Magi instantly makes them the best spellcaster in any 50 mile radius. Any spellcasting character has nothing to fear while wielding the Staff of the Magi, which is why it comes in at 18th place. And at 17th place is the best way to travel through the plains, it's the Cubic Gate. The Cubic Gate is very simple. With its six sides, it allows you to travel through different planes of existence as decided on by the GM. You can transport you and other creatures around you there via either a Gate spell or a Plane Shift spell. This item has so much role-playing potential and really opens up the Dungeon Master's world. However, its power is not to be trifled with. Being able to cast Plane Shift with a save DC of 17 can be a get-out-of-jail-free card for a lot of parties, especially because there are many enemies without a great charisma save. Or on the other hand, the party can use this item to duck out of pretty much any fight that they want. Or they can bounce back and forth from up to six different planes, which is a lot of work on a Dungeon Master's part. This is one of those items that has the capacity to completely overwhelm a new Dungeon Master in a D&D game, or make obstacles present in a story completely meaningless. 
I can't tell you exactly how, but whenever planeswalking starts to get involved in a D&D adventure, things get weird. And the Cubic Gate is almost certainly going to make your D&D games a little bit weirder. So Dungeon Masters, beware. This is an incredibly powerful magical item, and that's why it's here at spot 17. Now, have you ever faced an enemy that's evil in D&D 5th edition? Oh, you have? Well, if you were wielding the Talisman of Pure Good, that enemy would be shaking in their boots. The item coming in at 16th place is very simple. This legendary item can only be attuned to by a creature of the good alignment. It can act as a holy symbol for clerics and paladins and grants a plus two bonus to spell attack rolls. This talisman has seven charges. As an action, you can use a charge to target a creature of an evil alignment within 120 feet of you. If that creature fails a DC 20 dexterity saving throw, it's destroyed. It literally just falls into a hole and it dies. This is an instant kill button. This item will straight up wreck your D&D game if you are not careful. Your players will roll up on your BBEG and murder them. I don't care if the dragon has three legendary resistances. The talisman of pure good can overcome it. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. If an evil creature fails that save, they are destroyed, leaving no remains. The Talisman of Pure Good is an absolute monster of an item. Now the reason why its counterpart, the Talisman of Ultimate Evil, doesn't make this list is because unless you're playing in an evil campaign, the amount of good aligned creatures you're going to be fighting is usually pretty small. It's just not as useful. You're going to be fighting evil creatures a lot more than you're going to be fighting good creatures. Which is why the Talisman of Pure Good is here, and the Talisman of Ultimate Evil is unfortunately left off the list. Next up, though, at spot number 15 is the Mantle of Spell Resistance. This is a very simple magic item. It gives you advantage on all saving throws against spells while you're wearing this cloak. Why is it so high? Because it's only a rare item. It's not unlikely that you can find this item early in an adventure. And flat advantage against all spell saves is so good. It doesn't matter if you're a martial character, if you're a spellcaster, or if you're a hybrid, somewhere in between. This rare item has a simple yet powerful effect that can be used throughout the entirety of a campaign, which is why it comes in at spot number 15. And next up, at spot number 14, we have the Plate Armor of Etherealness. This is a regular suit of plate armor except for one feature. As an action, you can speak a command word and cast the spell Etherealness on yourself. The spell lasts for 10 minutes or until you remove the armor or use an action to speak the command word again. Why is this item so high? Well, for two reasons. Reason number one, it's an I win button on stealth encounters. The etherealness spell allows you to walk through walls while invisible. You'll never need to worry about failing a stealth check again unless you have a creature across from you that can detect things in the ethereal plane, which is a real threat at higher levels. But for 90% of stealth encounters, the etherealness spell is going to carry you through. This second reason goes hand in hand with the first, but the etherealness spell is fantastic for clearing out dungeons. Being able to walk through walls and be invisible to enemies allows you to scout out what a dungeon's going to be like. No longer do you need to put the rogue in danger. And for some reason, if the character gets caught, it's a character that can wear plate armor. They have the hit points to fight their way out of that situation. The plate armor of etherealness just takes care of so many weaknesses for so many marshals. Therefore, I had to give it the 14th spot on this list. And next up is a simple item that I think needs no real introduction. At 13th place is the Amulet of Health. Hit points, they're what determines if we're alive or dead in D&D 5th edition. They're controlled by your constitution score. Being able to automatically set your constitution to 19, eh, that's fantastic. Previously on this list, we've talked about the power of being able to set an ability score to 19. The headband of intellect, which affects a dump stat many consider in intelligence, cracked the top 100. The gauntlets of ogre power came in at spot number 61. So you had to know that the amulet of health was going to take one of the top spots on the list. I think this item as well is doubly important for spellcasters. As constitution affects your concentration saves, and already having a smaller hit die means that any additional point of health you can get is so important. However, I would be wary about giving this item out as a DM too early. It could radically shift the balance of power in your game depending on who gets this item. I once saw an Amulet of Health be given out at 3rd level, and the wizard took it, and instantly they had more health than the Barbarian. A wizard, a spellcaster, with more health than the Barbarian, the frontline tank. Needless to say, the party felt off for a long while after that. This is not an item that I would recommend giving out early, at all. 
it is just so powerful. Which is why it comes in at the 13th spot on the list. And at the 12th spot on the list is the Wand of the War Mage, plus 3. I don't need to spend a lot of time here talking about this item. It's a plus 3 weapon, but for mages. Many spells that use attack rolls also come with additional effects, and many more can also be used at further distances away, allowing the actual user to do so more safely. From my personal experience, a plus 3 Wand of the War Mage carries the same significance as a plus 4, maybe even a plus 5 weapon. It just makes spellcasters more powerful in the place they are strongest. And for that reason, it comes in at spot number 12 on the list. And finally, the last item before we reach the top 10, the legendary Ring of Spell Turning. The Ring of Spell Turning is like the Mantle of Spell Resistance, as it gives advantage on saving throws against any spell that targets only you. So it's a bit more limited than the Mantle of Spell Resistance. However, its secondary effect is busted. If you roll a 20 on your spell save, and the spell is 7th level or lower, meaning a majority of spells, you are going to deflect that spell back at the caster. And may I remind you, you already have advantage on spell saving throws, so you're going to be rolling a lot more 20s than normal. On the right character, this item can break the game. Maybe you have a 15th level Zealot Barbarian that has the hit points of a god. Usually you'd be targeting them with certain magical spells to slow them down. Give them the Ring of Spell turning, and that's not going to work. Heck, the enemy mage might end up feeble-minding themselves. This item is no joke and can make an epic final battle into a trivial encounter. This is an item that deserves its spot being so high on this list. Coming in at the number 10 spot is the plus 3 armor. At any level, a plus 3 set of magic armor is going to make it so enemies struggle to hit you. This is because of a concept known as bounded accuracy. Now I've talked about bounded accuracy many times over the course of this series. But as a recap, the basic premise of Bounded Accuracy is simple, that the designers of D&D 5th Edition make no assumptions about the player's attack and spell accuracy, or their defenses, or anything relating to character progression. Instead, the designers of 5th Edition only looked at the amount of hit points a character had, the amount of damage that they could deal, and various new abilities gained. Therefore, the designers of 5th edition are always expecting AC to be relatively stable. This is also true for monster stat blocks. That's why the max AC we find in D&D 5th edition is 25, because that's what a first level character can hit. So at any level, a plus 3 to armor is going to throw off that bounded accuracy. The designers intentionally were not assuming AC increases like in 3.5 or 4th edition. Thus a 15% increase in AC has a huge impact. Now throughout this series, I've been putting magic shields in front of magic armor. So if you've been watching, you're probably questioning why a plus 3 set of armor is all of a sudden better than a plus 3 shield. And that's for two reasons. Firstly, I value item versatility. By this level, more classes and more builds can use a plus 3 set of armor than a plus 3 shield. I'm trying to take into account the number of characters by epic levels that are using two-handed weapons, staves, or dual wielding. And by the time you're getting a plus 3 set of armor, you can probably also find an animated shield or something of the sort if you really want that extra protection. I rank this item so highly partially just to point out how powerful any increase to AC is in 5th edition. Many young dungeon masters often make the mistake of giving AC increases far too early. Quite frankly, there were few campaigns that I ever even considered giving out a plus 3 set of armor. This set of items is that powerful, and therefore it's coming in here at spot number 10 on the list. And up next at spot number 9 is the best friend of any spellcaster, the Robe of the Arch Magi. Pound for pound, I don't think there's any better item for a spellcaster in 5th edition D&D. This item can significantly increase a mage's AC, setting their base at 15. And we just talked about bounded accuracy, so you know why that's so good. In addition to this, you have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. I ranked the Spell Guard Shield the 21st best item for this effect alone. The wording of this feature is so important because it not only applies to spells but all other magical effects. It makes the Robe of the Arch Magi useful in campaigns even if you're not fighting enemy spellcasters. A Beholder's Eye Beam, a Dragon's Breath Weapon, and more are all countered by this item. And on top of all this, you gain a bonus of 2 to your spell save DC and your attack rolls. Once again, this is affecting bounded accuracy. You're becoming better at everything spell related. The Robe of the Arch Magi is a beast of a magic item. 
It combines three powerful items into one, and it is the tantalizing dream of spellcasters everywhere across D&D 5th edition. Now if this robe is the dream of all spellcasters, then our next item at number 8, the Holy Avenger, is the dream of all paladins. In fact, it might be the Paladin's Holy Grail, a plus 3 weapon that does an extra 2d10 radiant damage against fiends and undead. Plus, its aura grants advantage on spells and spell effects. And that's to you and all friendly creatures. We just got done talking about how good the Robe of the Arch Magi is for this reason. And now you can spread this benefit to all your party members. This weapon in the hands of a paladin is busted, but that's also what's holding it back because only a paladin can attune to this item. I value item versatility, and honestly if the Holy Avenger could be attuned to by more classes, it would definitely move up this list. But because it's a paladin only item, it comes in at number 8 on the list. Now at number 7 we have one of my personal favorite items, the Belt of Giant Strength. This is actually a class of items ranging between a rare item to legendary items. The Belts of Giant Strength grant between a 21 and a 29 strength score depending on the rarity. And this is one of my absolute favorite items to give any martial character. In my experience, this item can almost single-handedly bridge the divide between martials and spellcasters. The supernatural strength that this item provides helps to scale the damage of marshals, but also makes them far more effective out of combat. Because again, they are supernaturally strong. While wearing a belt of giant strength, marshals can perform feats of human strength that are far beyond any mortal's capabilities. And from a role-playing perspective, giving marshals supernatural strength just feels right at a certain point. Yes, spellcasters can bend reality, but that raging barbarian with 27 strength can just punch through a bank vault door. Honestly, I found that in the right party, giving out a belt of giant strength can overshadow spellcasters. Which is why I like to give this item to marshals after level 11, because that's when I see the divide really starting to increase. And even here, it's a toss-up between giving a belt of fire giant or cloud giant strength depending on the party and their power levels. But simply put, any belt of giant strength is going to have a fundamental impact on your D&D party. If you're a martial character and you have the ability to get a belt of giant strength, I highly encourage you to go for it. And so because of its seismic impact to any D&D campaign, the belts of giant strength come in here, at spot number 7 on the list. And at 6 we have another accessory, the Ring of Invisibility. One ring to rule them all. Taking blatant inspiration from J.R.R. Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings, this ring does exactly what it says, it makes you invisible. As an action, you and everything that you're wearing can turn invisible, and you stay invisible until you attack or cast a spell or use a bonus action to become visible again. Invisibility anytime, anywhere is great for any character. Give this item to the loud fighter so that they can actually succeed on their stealth checks for once. Or to the rogue if you have a death wish. And if you have any more questions about why this item is so powerful, I believe that they made three movies that you can watch. They won a lot of awards from what I've heard. Next up though, we have my highest rated rare magic item. And it's probably not what you think. At spot number 5 is the Cloak of Displacement. I'm here to tell all of you that the Cloak of Displacement can absolutely break your game. As someone who has run more than 30 D&D campaigns in 5th edition, this rare item has been the biggest pain in my ass. Now why is that? Well, while wearing this cloak until you take damage in a round, all attack rolls against you have disadvantage. Give this to a character with a high enough AC and they become nigh impossible to hit. You can attempt to suppress this with AoE damage, but even then it's not a surefire thing. Paladins, rogues, wizards, and literally every other class benefits from this item. If I'm playing in a campaign, there is no end to the things I'll do to get a Cloak of Displacement. In actual D&D play, I found few better items. Disadvantage is a huge penalty in D&D 5th edition, and even if there are some turns where this item doesn't have an effect, it is literally always there. It does not shut off. I found the value you gain from the Cloak of Displacement far surpasses many other items in the rare, very rare, and legendary category. Obviously, it's my number 5 ranked item, and that's partially why it's so high. I could see if this was a very rare or legendary item. But because it's a rare item, it's going to show up earlier on in your campaigns. 
and I don't think there's any better rare item that you can get in basic D&D 5th edition. I will die on the Cloak of Displacement's Hill. Now if I didn't want to die on the Cloak of Displacement's Hill, I would probably be wearing the Armor of Invulnerability, my 4th ranked item on this list. And it's also my highest rated armor on the list. Baseline for this item is that you gain resistance to non-magical damage, but as an action you can make yourself immune to non-magical damage for up to 10 minutes or until the armor is removed. Therefore, things like an ancient dragon's tail attack, the tentacle slam, the demogorgon, or anything done by a Tarask will not harm you. Seriously, you could send a 5th level fighter with this armor and a magic sword and they'd have a pretty solid chance to kill a Tarask. This item is top tier. You are going to get so much value from it. Only at higher levels when you're dealing with so much magical damage can it be thought of as anything close to not game breaking. But even still, it is by far the best armor in the entirety of 5e, and certainly a character if not campaign defining item. Unless you're homebrewing the heck out of a campaign, you're going to find that non-magical damage is extremely common. And a character being able to make themselves immune to that damage, knocks out a huge portion of the monster manual, and can trivialize many encounters. And I suppose the next item can trivialize many encounters as well, but in a flashier way. At number 3 we have the Vorpal Sword. This is a blade of legendary design and quality. It's a plus three weapon that ignores slashing resistance. But the thing that makes this thing legendary is what happens when you roll a natural 20 on an attack roll. When you roll a natural 20, you cut off your target's head. If your target can't survive without a head, it dies. And if your GM tries to get around this ability, you just do an extra 6d8 slashing damage. So on average, an extra 27 damage. The insta-kill potential of the Vorpal Blade sets it above any of its peers. And when you combine this with classes like the Barbarian or Samurai Fighters that can gain advantage on their attacks, you can have characters that can absolutely cut down their foes. A Vorpal Blade essentially necessitates that your boss monsters be legendary creatures. Else one attack is all it takes to turn 800 hit points of that dragon to zero. On any given game night, a player with a Vorpal Sword can absolutely wreck any encounter single-handedly that you put up against them. If you're a DM watching this, throwing out a Vorpal Sword at early levels will break your game. However, it's also one of the most fun magic items in the game, in my opinion. If you want to deploy a Vorpal Sword early on in your campaigns, I recommend doing this to the item. So far, it's worked for me as a DM, and my players have loved it. But now we're down to the top two basic magic items in D&D 5th edition. And to get this high on the list, basically you have to offer a wish of some kind. Which is why the Ring of Three Wishes comes in as my number two overall item. Gaining three wishes is great. It's like finding a genie, but with no genie. The wish spell is a reality bending nuclear bomb for any D&D character. Gaining three of those nuclear bombs is game breaking. I don't think I need to talk about all the reasons why a wish spell is so powerful. But the wish spell does have one weakness, there's a 33% chance that you can never be able to cast the spell again. So potentially, with the Ring of Three Wishes, you yourself can get one wish out of the item and then never use it again. However, this item doesn't require attunement and you can always just pass it off to another party member. And that's literally its only downside. And yet, as well, even if you do get all three wishes, the ring will eventually become inert. This is technically a consumable item. And so that's why the number one item on this list has to be the Luck Blade. Ah yes, the Luck Blade. This plus one sword also gives you a plus one to all your saves. Additionally, it allows you to re-roll one ability check, saving throw, or attack roll once per day. Look, sometimes one roll is the difference between a TPK and defeating the villain of your entire campaign. Being able to get that critical re-roll at the right time without even spending an action is incredibly good. And to top all of this off, the Luck Blade comes with up to three wishes. Even if you only get one wish from this item, it's still a great item. At the end of the day, the Luck Blade is a reality warping weapon that fixes any D&D character's greatest weakness, your own luck. You can build the most mathematically perfect character, but at the end of the day, if you're just not rolling well, it's not going to matter. That's why the Luck Blade is so good. It helps to remove that randomness and gives you a chance in any situation. 
and therefore there can be no better item than item zero, the deck of many things. Yes, I tricked you. There's actually 101 items on this list. But the deck of many things, depending on what cards you draw, can go anywhere from spot number 1 to spot number 100. This item is a gambler's dream and a dungeon master's nightmare. Out of a 22 card deck, there are 11 good cards and 11 bad cards. About 4 of those cards can cripple any character, and about 4 of those cards can cripple any DM. This item is 100% game-breaking. It is either by far the best or worst item in the game. You can rewrite reality itself with this item even beyond the abilities of a wish spell. There is no other item that can strike fear into the hearts of a DM and their players equally at the same time. It is so powerful and yet so bad. Adding a deck of many things into your game means that you're a little bit crazy. Which is why I love to do it. This item taps into the sheer goofiness that is D&D, and is an item that writes its own stories. I couldn't adequately find a place for this item, because really the deck of many things stands on its own in 5th edition. Which is why it occupies position 0. It is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. It is item number 1 and item number 100 at the exact same time. Now if you've supported this entire series so far, thank you so much. Consider liking, subscribing, and commenting if you've liked this content. And if you want more, check out this video right here. And thank you for entering the dungeon.